Having found himself reincarnated into the My Hero world, our main protagonist will try to live up to his namesake. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Iron Man in MHA. Part 3. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Also, remember to check out the original story linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa were seen with injection pistols in their hands, aimed at their arms. Every time they pressed the trigger, they winced slightly, and Friday would call out how many times they had done it. Ouch. 46. Ouch. 47. Hmm. 48. 49. Stings as much as it did the other 48 times. Tony grunted as they both started flicking their arms. After they were done, Baymax appeared and started cleaning the bloody parts of their arms. The micro receivers are safely implanted. Shall we perform a test run? Friday asked. Unfortunately, there's no time. We're already late to school as it is. Tony grumbled as he flicked his arms once more. But how do we know they will work? Melissa asked as they went and started grabbing their stuff. Because I'm Tony Stark, that's why. Tony said confidently as they both rushed out and got on his motorcycle. It wasn't long before they arrived at UA and got into class, where they found the others already seated, waiting for them. You two are late, Aizawa said plainly. Sorry, sorry, both Tony and Melissa said apologetically as they went and sat down in their seats. They went on with their day until it was time for their class with Aizawa once more. Aizawa was standing in front of everyone. Now for today's basic hero training. This time, All Might, myself, and one other will be supervising. We will be preparing you for disaster relief, from fires to floods. Basically, rescue training, everyone immediately got excited. I doubt it will be a normal training course. A flood is where I will most excel. Ribbit. Man, I'm so pumped. I get to see if all that extra training really worked. Quiet down, everyone. There is more to it, Aizawa demanded. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a remote. It is up to each of you if you want to wear your costume, as some of them are ill-suited for this type of activity. Aizawa clicked a button, and the walls started to protrude, showing the cases with their hero suits. The training site is a bit remote, so we will be going by bus. Let's all get ready. They all soon stood by the bus wearing their hero costumes. Tony and Melissa were wearing their skin suits with their helmets in hand. Whoa, you guys look badass. Kaminari praised as he studied their looks. I'll say you guys look like ninjas, Siro said, giving them a thumbs up. Why are you guys always wearing something different? Mina asked curiously. Because I'm always improving my suits to be better than the last. Why do you guys have swords and guns? Aizawa couldn't help but ask. Tony gave him a thumbs up as he grinned. Because they're cool as hell. Be careful with them, Aizawa warned. Don't worry, we know. Melissa nodded with a serious expression. So, what do you guys think? They all heard someone in between Tony and Melissa causing them all to jump in surprise. Who said that? Mineta asked, looking around rapidly. It's me, Hagakure. And tell me honestly, does this outfit make me look fat? Wow, I didn't even realize you were here, Hagakure. Urarika said, impressed. Pretty cool, right? Even though they couldn't see her, they could detect her smugness. Aizawa then motioned for everyone to go inside the bus and be seated. Once they were seated, they began their drive. I've been meaning to ask, but Melissa, you call All Might Uncle Might. Why is that? Ajui asked. Oh yeah, I completely forgot that you did that. Now I'm curious, Mina said. Melissa grew embarrassed as she scratched the back of her head. You see, my dad was once All Might's assistant while he was in America. So he's always been a constant presence in my life since I was a little girl. He was like that super cool uncle. So I started calling him Uncle Might since I was little. Wow, you've basically known All Might your entire life. 
That's so cool. Urarika exclaimed. They all continued to talk and developed a deeper friendship the more they talked. Some were even poking fun at Bakugo's personality, which came as a great shock to Midoriya. They soon made a sharp turn and arrived at a large building. They all got out and lined up in front of the person waiting for them inside. It was the Space Hero 13, an A-rank rescue hero. Midoriya and Urarika began to geek out upon seeing him. Aizawa walked up towards 13. Is All Might here? He whispered. I'm afraid not, he got distracted by people needing help. Every time he makes his way here, new people just keep needing his help. So he's a little late, 13 explained. Aizawa clicked his tongue. What about the others? They have hidden themselves outside, ready to intervene when the moment arises. 13 quickly informed him. Aizawa nodded as 13 turned to look at everyone present and held up a finger. Everyone, I have a point to make. So listen up. Actually, it's two, maybe three, probably four, he said, holding up four fingers. As many of you are aware, my quirk is called Black Hole. Can suck up and tear anything apart. I have used it to save many in disastrous situations. However, my power can just as easily kill someone if I'm not careful. I have no doubt some of you have similar abilities. In our superpowered society, the use of quirks is heavily restricted and monitored. It may seem like the system is a stable one, but we mustn't forget that it just takes one wrong move from an uncontrollable quirk for people to die. This class will show you how to effectively utilize your quirks to save lives. Your powers are not meant to inflict harm. I hope you all leave here today with the understanding that you're meant to help people. 13 then bowed towards everyone. Thank you all for listening. As most gave him a round of applause, Tony pointed behind them. Yeah, that's nice and all, but we are being attacked. Thirteen and Aizawa quickly turned around in time to see a hole forming in the air behind them. The portal expanded, showing Tamura sticking a hand out before revealing his face. It then expanded further, throwing out more villains. Melissa and Tony were the first to move. They both rushed past Aizawa and Thirteen, stood on top of the railing, and pulled out their guns from their sides. They immediately began firing electric bullets, which electrocuted some of the villains while others shrugged it off. What is going on? Ida asked Aizawa, who clicked his tongue at Tony's and Melissa's actions. We're being attacked by villains. Be in constant vigilance. Aizawa shouted as he pulled up his goggles. Tony, Melissa, get back. This isn't a game, Aizawa commanded. Don't you think we know that? Tony said as he kept firing. Tamura kept dodging and looking toward Tony and Melissa in annoyance. As more villains kept coming out, Tony's eyes widened. Just how many Nomis are there? There are already about five. Tamura looked around as he dodged. Where is he? I didn't come all this way for nothing. Maybe a couple of dead kids will bring him here. Tony, you're the class president. Take care of everyone and lead them to safety, Aizawa said as he jumped down. That's practically suicide. Aizawa's quirk works best one-on-one. -on -one. He will be helpless out there, Midoriya said. Ready to jump in as well. Midoriya, wait. Let Melissa go. She is better trained to fight against a group of people. No, I can't allow that. Thirteen interfered. No offense, but as the class president, I know their capabilities better. Ida, you're the fastest one apart from me. Head outside. There will be teachers awaiting an ambush. Call them in, Tony quickly commanded. Just then, a Nomu with light blue skin, a yellow beak, and wings came flying toward them, while a black portal appeared behind them. You aren't going anywhere. I get to decide that, Kurojiri said, his figure appearing to block the exit. Meanwhile, the Nomu in the air stretched out both its arms, causing them to rapidly elongate toward Tony. Tony grabbed his sword from his back, and it glowed bright red as the hands were ready to grab him. Tony cut them apart. Greetings. We are the League of Villains. Based on your conversation, it appears you were aware of our Bakugo, Todoroki, neck brace. Don't order me around, damn it. Bakugo yelled as they both rushed toward Kirojiri. Bakugo was blasting through the air, while Todoroki rushed in, turning his ice into a path to skate ahead. Seeing the attack coming, 
Kirojiri started to spread himself, but Bakugo was faster. He held the neck brace and blasted him to the ground. And just in time, Todoroki appeared and froze the entire neck brace to the ground, making it hard for Kirojiri to move. Ida, what are you waiting for? Move, Tony shouted. Ida nodded and rushed outside the door. There are villains attacking, he shouted at the top of his lungs. Third person's POV. As Melissa jumped down towards Aizawa, she kicked a man with four arms and rock skin hard enough that he went flying back, crashing into another man. What are you doing here? You should be with the others. Aizawa yelled as he wrapped his scarf around a man with shark-like teeth, pulled him in, and knocked him out with a knee to the face. A woman with long purple hair controlled it and shot it forward, wrapping her hair around Melissa's arms as they reached for her sword. Sorry, class president's orders, Melissa said as she twisted her arm around the strands of hair, reaffirming her grip and pulled the woman towards her. As the woman came flying towards her, Melissa jumped, spinning around and hitting those around her with the woman's body until she was knocked unconscious, causing the tendrils of hair to unwrap from her arms. Aizawa watched as Melissa ran and slid under a two-meter-tall man before kicking him on the back of the knee, causing the man to kneel. Melissa quickly got up and used the man's knee as a springboard to knee the bottom of his chin, sending him flying back and knocking him unconscious. Aizawa was impressed. Fine. You can help, but follow my lead. His words were cut short by Melissa whipping out her gun and shooting without looking. A light blue energy bullet went past his face, hitting someone in his blind spot. When Aizawa turned to look, he saw a woman whose torso was encased in ice, unable to move. Don't get distracted now, sensei, Melissa said in amusement. Aizawa scoffed, hearing the amusement in her voice, before wrapping his scarf around a woman who was shooting acid from her fingers. With one look from his eyes, the acid stopped, allowing him to immediately subdue her. Tamura gave them a quick glance. Nomu number three, take care of them. If taking out the students isn't bringing all might, maybe taking out both a teacher and a student will, he said as he began scratching his neck. A Nomu with pure white skin and a skull over its face began running towards Melissa and Aizawa, the ground shaking with each step. Nomu stuck its hand out forward, and from its fingertips, bones began to appear before flying like bullets. Melissa quickly reacted. She grabbed her swords and deflected all the bones from reaching her and Aizawa, who was preoccupied with someone else. What is that thing? Aizawa asked as he stared at Nomu. I don't know, but I don't detect any life from them, Melissa said as she ran with her sword out. Melissa went to cut Nomu with her sword, but its skin was too tough. Nomu backhanded her with enough force to send her flying away from Aizawa. Melissa! Aizawa yelled before directing his gaze at the Nomu. Aizawa ran towards the Nomu, but his attacks didn't do anything. No matter how much Aizawa attacked, the Nomu grabbed Aizawa by his torso and began to squeeze, causing him to scream in pain. Melissa then appeared from the air, her sword glowing a dangerous red color. She slashed her sword down on the Nomu's wrist that was holding Aizawa. The Nomu let out a painful screech and released Aizawa. Melissa was halfway through Nomu's thick bones when it began swinging its arm in a frenzy. Aizawa blinked, allowing Nomu to activate its cork again. Long bone spikes began to grow from its arms, hitting Melissa but not causing significant damage. If Melissa had to describe them, she would say they were uncomfortable. Melissa quickly realized what Nomu was going to do. She let go of her sword and dropped down to pick up Aizawa. Bone spikes flew forward, and Melissa used her body to cover Aizawa, causing some of the spikes to hit her. Melissa! Shit! Are you alright? Aizawa asked with worry. It's fine. These suits are kinda indestructible, so I'm not really injured. But that doesn't mean I can't feel the pain, Melissa briefly explained. Nomu grabbed the sword from its wrist and tried to crush it, but couldn't. It simply threw it away as white matter began to fill the entire cut point, making it whole again. His entire body is made out of bones. Melissa quickly figured out what was happening. It looks like I will need to call for an upgrade. She muttered as she quickly made a signal with her hands. There are villains attacking. They heard Ida shouting. As Ida called for backup, 
The Nomu facing Tony opened its beak and started breathing fire. Tony immediately reached for his sword, twirled it in his hands, and sent a light blue X of cold energy, creating a large smoke explosion. As all the UA teachers and heroes rushed in, Kurojiri sighed. Looks like we need to improve. He muttered before exploding into a giant black mist that started swallowing everyone. Even the heroes. The explosion took Bakugo and Todoroki by surprise, sending them flying back, with the ice holding him beginning to crack due to the pressure. Everyone was immediately swallowed by the black mist. As they were disappearing, they heard Tony's orders, watch each other's backs and stick together. Tony appeared falling in the air with the Nomu right in front of him. The Nomu swung its limb and wrapped its stretched out arm around Tony, pulling him closer. As it opened its beak, it released flames directly at him. When the flames stopped, Tony was unharmed. Thanks for the tan, but your breath stinks, Tony said as he began pushing his arms out, causing the arm wrapped around him to widen, giving him space. Tony then tucked his arms back in, and the space in the arm was now completely open, allowing Tony to slip through the gap. Toodaloo, he said as he began to dive. Seeing that Tony had escaped, the Nomu tucked its wings together and dove after him. As Tony was diving, he double-tapped his shoes together. As he neared the water below, his shoes morphed into thruster shoes. Just before he hit the water, the sequence finished and the thrusters activated, allowing Tony to narrowly avoid hitting the surface. The same couldn't be said for the Nomu. As Tony avoided it, the Nomu dove right in, creating a giant splash of water. Ha ha! Sucker! He exclaimed. Just then, a giant Nomu with the head of a shark jumped from the water and took a large bite of Tony. As its teeth clung to Tony, it shook its head with ferocity and threw him away before diving back into the water. Tony began skipping along the water like a stone, eventually sinking into the water. As he floated down, he saw the two Nomus swimming towards him. Tony sighed as he saw them coming. All right, that's it. Come to Papa, my sons. Friday, give me a countdown. 25, 24, 25 seconds? Are you kidding me? 23. Tony quickly used his thrusters to maneuver out of the way of the shark Nomu that tried to bite him again. Tony had to put a leg to the side and dodge the other Nomu that was in the water with him. 20. Tony had to dodge the limbs of the Nomu while in the water as well. They spun around him as he began swinging. Once they got close, Tony tried to use his sword, but it wasn't as effective underwater. 15. Tony tried to cut the skin of the shark, but his sword blade would just slip right past it. Slippery skin, great, he thought. Tony immediately used his thrusters to dive down, causing the other Nomu to miss and hit the shark Nomu instead. Blood started to rise to the surface. 10. The only energy bullets that were effective were the pure energy ones, as any other element would be useless underwater. Tony pulled out his gun and began firing at them as they swam towards him. The wound on the shark side slowly closed. 5. Hearing this, Tony began to go up. Just below him, the two were slowly catching up with him. 3. Tony saw the surface of the water just a few inches away from his face. 2. The two Nomus had caught up to him. So Tony used the shark Nomu's nose as a springboard, lifting him up towards the surface while simultaneously grabbing his sword sheath and gun holsters. 1. As Tony broke through the water's surface, he tossed his swords and guns away, using the Nomu's momentum to propel himself higher into the air. He turned to face the Nomus, spreading his arms and legs out. Pieces of his Iron Man armor flew down behind him, assembling and combining over his body to form a sleek silver Iron Man suit. The repulsors on his hands opened and expanded, sending out two large beams of repulsion energy that pushed the two Nomus back into the water. The two beams of repulsion created large craters in the water, causing them to clash like two waves smashing into each other. Tony got into a hovering position and spread out his arms slightly as he took a deep breath. Smells just like a new car, doesn't it? Friday? The first to jump out of the water was the shark Nomu, but Tony only held his forearm out for protection. As the Nomu bit down, most of its teeth shattered into pieces. Adamantium, 
9 out of 10 dentists wouldn't recommend it. Bad for the teeth. Tony's chest repulsors opened and shot an even larger beam down, hitting the other Nomu as collateral damage. An even larger hole formed in the middle, creating a sinkhole where water just flowed toward. Friday, status? They are both unconscious, sir. Good, Tony said as he turned around and flew away from the sinkhole that was slowly being covered by water once more. Third person's POV. Melissa heard the sound of glass shattering above them and smirked as she took off her sword sheath and gun holsters, throwing them to the side. Meanwhile, as Aizawa knocked someone out, he looked up in confusion. What is that? My upgrades. Melissa smirked as she charged towards Nomu. The Nomu grew spikes all over its body and charged toward Melissa. As the Nomu threw a spiked punch, Melissa used its momentum to leap onto its arm and run up to its shoulder. Once on its shoulder, she jumped into the air, twirling as pieces of her Iron Maiden suit assembled onto her body. She quickly activated the thrusters and came flying down with a punch so powerful it created a sonic boom. As her punch connected with the Nomu's head, everyone around was thrown back. The Nomu was brought to the ground by Melissa's strength. When she landed, the ground around her cracked. She remained crouched in a superhero landing, her fist still connected to the Nomu. Cracks spread through the Nomu's body, especially its skull, with multiple pieces of bone visible and her fist imprinted. Melissa slowly looked up, her eyes glowing with energy and power. Although the skin suits are great, nothing beats the original. Melissa's HUD locked onto the faces of multiple villains in the surroundings, each identified with precision through her advanced targeting system. From her shoulders, small compartments opened, revealing an array of non-lethal, high-voltage projectiles. In swift succession, the projectiles launched out like bullets, each one aimed with pinpoint accuracy. Upon impact, the projectiles delivered powerful electrical shocks, effectively incapacitating the targets without causing permanent harm. The villains convulsed briefly as the electricity surged through their bodies before collapsing to the ground, immobilized. Melissa looked at the repulsors in her hands and at her purple and golden armor. Nice. Meanwhile, with the others, Momo, Jiro, and Kaminari appeared in the mountain zone of the USJ. By their side was Midnight, looking around and preparing for battle. In front of them were villains, all with different quirks, awaiting to fight. Stand behind me, Midnight ordered as she ripped part of her hero outfit. Momo didn't listen. From her suit, she pulled out a bow staff, twirled it around, and stood by midnight. Sorry, we're training to be heroes. I can't stand by and watch you fight on your own. Jiro and Kaminari followed Momo's lead and stood by her side. She's right. We can't let you fight on your own, Jiro said, her ear jacks connecting to the device in her hands. What kind of man, much less a hero, would I be if I let such beautiful ladies fight while I stand back? Kaminari smirked as his hand crackled with electricity. Midnight looked towards them and smiled. Try to keep up, she said as she rushed towards the group of villains. Momo followed immediately after, with the others right behind her. In the ruined zone, Bakugo and Todoroki dropped down, with Kirishima coming right after with Cementos. Noticing the villains around, Cementos put his hands on the ground, and immediately walls of cement protected Kirishima and the others leaving Cementos to face the villains by himself, until he heard an explosion behind him, which sent cement parts flying everywhere. Stop getting in the way, you blockhead! Bakugo yelled as he blasted himself forward towards the villains. Kirishima had his entire body hardened as he rushed in after Bakugo with a large grin on his face. Don't hog all the villains to yourself, Bakugo! Todoroki appeared ice skating forward before stepping his foot on the ground, ice spreading everywhere and encasing most of the villains. Todoroki's breath began to appear as it slowly escaped from his mouth. Cementos sighed. Youngsters, always so reckless. Landslide zone. Satu, Mina, and Siro appeared, looking around apprehensively, noticing they were surrounded by villains. From above, Snipe dropped down and held out his revolvers in front of him. If you three want to make it out alive, Follow my lead. Downpour storm zone. Tokoyami and Kuda appeared with rain falling everywhere. 
dark shadow emerged from Tokoyami's robe. Tokoyami looked up towards the rain. This is the perfect place for me. They suddenly felt a presence behind them. When they turned around, they found Power Loader, ready for battle. We have to work together if we want to survive, Power Loader advised. Kuda and Tokoyami nodded in agreement as Dark Shadow went past Power Loader and punched a villain that was sneaking his way towards them. Conflagration Zone Ojiro was seen running around, his tail swinging wildly toward villains as they tried to attack him using their quirks. Occasionally, a villain's head would swing side to side before closing his leg in pain, toppling over. Wow, that is satisfying, Hagakure muttered, before rushing in a carefree manner toward the next villains. Multiple ectoplasms were seen helping both of them take down villains, each working as a team. As Tony flew over the water, he heard a loud shout followed by gushing water. Uhu Yihia! Tony flew towards the source to find present Mike in the air while Azui's tongue was wrapped around his waist, hoisting him up. Below them were villains in a whirlpool of water and purple balls, most of them already knocked out as they were being pulled toward the center. As Azui pulled her tongue back and present Mike landed back on the boat with Midoriya and Mineta, they heard Tony shouting towards them. Jump and hold on. I'll take you guys to land. Tony had his arms out as he passed below them. They all jumped and took hold of Tony's arms. Present Mike held Tony's right hand as Mineta held present Mick's waist. I thought I was going to die. He cried out, blood flowing from his head. Midoriya held his left hand while Azui took a hold of his left arm. New suit? Ribbit, Azui asked. Yup, brand new. What do you think? It looks cool. Doesn't it just? Tony grinned as he flew them towards land. Be ready. There are villains everywhere. Which means as soon as we land we will be facing them, Tony advised. Or not, since I see that Melissa has taken care of it. Tony said awkwardly. Tony softly put them all on the ground. Almost immediately, Tamura started throwing a temper tantrum. No, 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 this wasn't how it was supposed to go. Tamura yelled, stomping and scratching his neck. The symbol of peace hasn't even arrived. How am I supposed to kill him if he's not here? It's all their fault. It's all their fault. Tamura stopped scratching his neck and sighed. Looks like I will need to get my hands dirty. I'll have fun until All Might arrives. Nomu number one, Nomu number two, take care of those students in the toy armor. I'll deal with their sensei. He's been using his eyes all this time. They must not work all that well by now. Tony turned into a silver blur as he and the purple Nomu from the anime both charged towards each other. They both stopped in front of each other and punched. As their fists connected, a strong gale force exploded followed by the sound of a large impact, which sounded close to an explosion. The ground beneath their feet cracked due to the strength they unleashed. There was a short pause before their fists started becoming a blur. They were both at a stalemate. Tony was stopping himself from flying off using his feet thrusters, while the Nomu barely moved due to its shock absorption quirk. They both then met in the middle with a strong push, their fingers interlocked as they tried to push each other. Tony's thrusters grew larger and stronger, pushing the Nomu back. It tried to stop itself, dirt being picked up by its feet as it was being pushed. Tony then smirked. The repulsor on his chest widened, glowing and humming with power. The Nomu tried to break away from Tony's grip but couldn't. Tony's hands were like vice grips, unable to release him. The Nomu yelled loudly in Tony's face before it tried headbutting him but it only ended up hurting itself. Tony released his grip as a large beam of repulsion engulfed the entire Nomu. The Nomu was sent flying back with no indication of stopping. The repulsor beam ripped through the air and ground, carrying the Nomu away, even managing to blast a hole through the USJ. The ground in front of Tony was scorched as he viewed the outside of the USJ. I am so awesome. It's crazy, Tony said smugly to himself. Third person's POV. The second Nomu was just as large and muscular as the one Tony faced, except this one had a long tail with fingers like razor-sharp claws. It got on all fours and, as it opened its mouth, let out a sonic roar that ripped through the ground as it made its way towards Melissa. 
Melissa used her thrusters to push herself out of the way of the sonic blast before flying towards the Nomu that was now charging at her, its tongue and tail swinging wildly. It slashed its claws towards her, but she blocked it with her forearm before uppercutting the Nomu into the air, thrusters on her elbows adding to her power. Melissa then flew up, following the Nomu, but it flipped forward, joining its hands together. As Melissa appeared before it, it hammered her down. Melissa plunged rapidly towards the ground, creating a large impact and a dust cloud. When the dust cleared, Melissa was seen on one knee, looking up at the Nomu as it appeared to be taking a large breath, ready to unleash another sonic scream. Melissa's thrusters blasted her right through the sonic roar. Seeing Melissa wasn't really affected by it, the Nomu swung its long tail towards her, trying to swat her down once more. But Melissa simply held out her hands and caught the tail. She used her foot thrusters to stabilize herself and the thrusters on her elbows to rapidly spin around. The Nomu tried to break free by wildly swinging its tail, but Melissa's grip was too strong. It tried to swing towards Melissa, but her spinning was too fast for it to properly move. Melissa then released it, throwing it towards the ground. As it fell, its back started turning red due to its falling speed. Its figure ripped through the ground, creating a miniature earthquake around the area. She dropped from the skies and landed on top of the Nomu in the middle of the crater, causing it to puke out purple blood. She used her elbow thrusters to send multiple punches towards the Nomu's face. At the same time, Tony had just sent another Nomu flying off with his chest repulsors, creating a giant hole on the side of the USJ. Tamura, who was rushing towards Aizawa, froze as he stared at Tony and Melissa. Although Tamura was quiet, it was all due to the anger he was feeling. He decided to switch targets, running towards Melissa and holding his hand out towards her back. Before he could reach her, a green light flashed in the corner of his eye as Midoriya came flying through and punched Tamura in the face, sending him flying back. Tamura went flying back as Midoriya came to a halt behind Melissa. He got into a fighting position with green arcs of energy flashing off of him. If you want to get through her, you're going to have to go through me, Midoriya said seriously. Tamura held his chin with four fingers in pain while he grew annoyed. Cheaters. You are all cheaters. You shouldn't have been able to take down the Nomis. They were all designed to take down All Might, not be beaten by cheaters with level 100 armor. He whined as he stood up. Kurojiri stood in front of the Hero 13, with Yurarika, Ida, and Shoji scattered around him. Don't stand too close. 13 ordered as he opened a cap around his finger and started pulling in the mist Kurojiri was releasing. From behind 13, Kurojiri's mist started to appear with a powerful suction, mostly from 13's own quirk. 13. Yurarika called out with worry. Ida immediately activated his leg engine and rushed towards 13, taking him away before his own quirk could fully affect him. Thank you, young hero, 13 said as Ida slid to a stop and put 13 down. Yurarika was on Shoji's arm, having made herself light. Shoji then swung his tentacle arm, which sent Yurarika flying. Yurarika reached out and grabbed Kurojiri's neck brace with both her hands, making him zero gravity. Yurarika then flung him towards the sky, away from them. As Kurojiri was in the air, he was able to see the entire USJ fully. He saw how all the teachers and students were working together to defeat the villains, how Tony and Melissa each took out the Nomis, and how Midoriya rushed in and punched Tamura off. Kurojiri sighed. All Might hasn't even arrived, and most of our forces are done for. I guess it's time to abort. Let's get the young master... Just as Tamura stood up, black mist began to appear behind him. Tony calmly walked next to Midoriya and held out his hand. The part connecting his forearm to his elbow disconnected, and his arm armor went flying towards Tamura. Tamura dodged, but the hand simply turned and grabbed Tamura's shirt, causing him to scoff. You shouldn't grow too confident in that tin can. Tamura put both hands on the armor that was holding him and waited. Kurojiri stepped out of the mist and was surprised to see that the suit wasn't disintegrating. Tamura quickly turned towards Aizawa, but he wasn't paying much attention to them, mostly securing all the knocked-out villains. They then turned towards Tony, who chuckled. You shouldn't grow confident in the thing you call a quirk, 
Tony said, putting his hand forth and calling his armor back. As the armor flew back towards Tony, Kirojiri started creating multiple portals with his mist all around them, making it difficult for the piece of armor to fly back towards Tony. Kirojiri grabbed the flying Tamura and ripped off the piece of clothing that Tony's armor was gripping. The armor piece, no longer bothered by Kirojiri, swiftly flew back to Tony's arm, seamlessly reattaching itself. Tony clicked his tongue in annoyance but remained focused. Melissa appeared after knocking the Nomu out and started shooting repulsors from her hands. However, Kirojiri's purple mist portals intercepted her attacks, redirecting the energy blasts to random locations. Tony joined the fray, firing his own repulsors. Some of the redirected blasts nearly hit them, but Tony and Melissa managed to dodge, their reflexes honed to perfection. They flew around Kirojiri, trying to find a blind spot, but Kirojiri had learned from past encounters and guarded his neck brace diligently. Tony and Melissa became blurs of purple and silver as they flew at Kirojiri from different angles. Kirojiri, however, was like a conductor orchestrating a symphony of chaos with his portals. Every time Tony or Melissa entered a portal, they were ejected from another, often disoriented and off-balance. Midoriya, not one to be left out, tried to jump Kirojiri, his one for all enhanced speed turning him into a green blur. Yet, Kirojiri was too careful, his misty portals redirecting Midoriya's every move. No matter how much he pushed his limits, he couldn't get close. Present Mike and Aizawa joined the battle. Present Mike unleashed his devastating sonic attacks, but Kirojiri's portals redirected the sound waves harmlessly into the distance. Aizawa's erasure quirk was ineffective, as he couldn't get a clear line of sight on Kirojiri's true eyes. Tony and Melissa regrouped mid-air, exchanging quick glances and formulating a plan. Tony sent a coded message to Melissa via their HUDs, and they split off, attacking Kirojiri from opposite sides in a coordinated assault. Their movements were precise and synchronized, making it harder for Kirojiri to predict their actions. Kirojiri continued to manipulate his portals, but the sheer speed and unpredictability of Tony and Melissa's attacks began to strain his abilities. They pressed their advantage, forcing Kirojiri to split his attention between the two of them. Midoriya saw an opening. With a burst of speed, he launched himself at Kirojiri, who was momentarily distracted. Present Mike amplified Midoriya's war cry with his own voice, adding to the confusion. Aizawa, seizing the moment, used his capture weapon to try and entangle Kirojiri. Kirojiri, sensing the imminent danger, created a massive portal to escape. But Tony and Melissa were ready. They unleashed a barrage of repulsors, targeting the edges of the portal, destabilizing it. Kirojiri struggled to maintain control, his form flickering between solidity and mist. Kirojiri, sensing the imminent danger, created a massive wave of black mist that surged outward, pushing everyone away with a powerful force. Tony, Melissa, Midoriya, Present Mike, and Aizawa were all sent flying, struggling to regain their footing. Tony's armor absorbed much of the impact, and he quickly stabilized himself mid-air. Melissa did the same, using her repulsors to counterbalance. Midoriya hit the ground rolling, immediately springing back to his feet. Present Mike and Aizawa landed with practiced agility, but the sheer force of the mist had created a significant distance between them and Kirojiri. Kirojiri's form flickered, the strain of maintaining such a large-scale defense evident. Yet, he managed to keep the black mist swirling around him, forming a protective barrier. He's getting away, Midoriya shouted, already sprinting forward, his one-for-all power crackling around him. Tony and Melissa exchanged quick glances, their HUDs updating in real time. They flew towards Kirojiri, repulsors blazing, trying to penetrate the mist barrier. Kirojiri, with a final effort, expanded the black mist further, creating a near impenetrable wall. Tony and Melissa's repulsor blasts were absorbed into the void, disappearing harmlessly. Present Mick's sonic attacks and Aizawa's capture weapon were equally ineffective against the dense mist. With a final, almost imperceptible nod, Kirojiri summoned all his remaining strength. The mist swirled and condensed around him, 
and in a flash, he and Tamura vanished into the darkness, escaping through a rapidly closing portal. Tony and Melissa landed, their masks lifting up, frustration etched on their faces. Midoriya stopped in his tracks, panting heavily. Present Mike and Aizawa regrouped, assessing the situation. Damn it, they got away, Tony muttered. Space quirks are a serious pain in the ass. I'll need to think of a way to counter them. Just barely, Melissa added, her eyes scanning the area for any lingering threats. Aizawa adjusted his goggles, his expression stern. We need to regroup and plan our next move. This isn't over. Midoriya nodded, determination blazing in his eyes. We'll get them next time. We'll be ready. Let's start by capturing all the villains that we can. Tony added. I am here. All Might burst through the door with a serious expression. You're useless. Tony, Aizawa, Melissa, and Present Mike shouted with anger. Third person's POV. Tony dove into the flood area once more and returned to shore with two unresponsive gnomus. All while All Might was being chastised primarily by the teachers. All Might rubbed the back of his head. Forgive me. I kept getting distracted. There were people that needed my help. I couldn't just ignore it. We needed your help as well, Aizawa said as he finished apprehending the villains close to them. You were aware of what was going on and what was going to happen. Something could have gone seriously wrong because you were being irresponsible. Midoriya looked surprised hearing this. They were aware we were going to be attacked by villains? All Might looked a bit ashamed of himself as Aizawa continued. If it wasn't for Stark and Melissa taking care of those big guys made to take you down, we would have had serious problems made to take me down? Wait, what are they really? All Might asked, confused. Frankenstein's monsters, Tony said as he dropped them at their feet. And I'm not joking when I say that. These are really a type of Frankenstein's monster. What did you find out about them? Aizawa asked. You know how Frankenstein was made out of multiple human parts and then brought to life by some crazy scientist? Yeah, these things are the same. They were made from the bodies of multiple people mixed with multiple quirks. Tony showed them a hologram from his armor forearm. You see, every person with a quirk has this thing called a quirk factor. No one really knows where they came from, whether it was man-made, the next step in the evolutionary line, or simply something from outer space. These quirk factors are the collective traits that compose a quirk. These things, or gnomus as the villains were calling them, have more than one quirk factor inside them. Meaning, they possess more than one quirk. They all muttered. All Might's expression turned to that of a grimace, as he had a faint idea of who the creators of the gnomus were. Why are they so unresponsive? They won't get up and attack us, right? Present Mike asked. No, they won't. They need orders, Melissa added as she jumped into the conversation. They are effectively brain dead. They respond to one person. If the person isn't present to give them orders, they do not know how to operate. In other words, they are on standby until further notice. Policemen then started appearing and began taking in the villains that were already in hero custody. Meanwhile, Momo was moving between villains, knocking them unconscious. A woman made a move and started shooting sharp metal pin needles. But Momo twirled her bow staff in front of her while running towards the woman. Seeing Momo getting close, the woman tried attacking with her fist. But Momo swatted it away with her staff before plunging the staff into the woman's stomach. A charge of electricity exited from the staff, causing the woman to scream out in pain before falling unconscious. Momo then threw her bow staff hitting the last villain that was running towards Kaminari, who had a stupid expression on his face and throwing two thumbs up. Jiro covered her mouth, trying to laugh but failing to contain it. Midnight had her foot on top of a pile of men and women who were sound asleep. Midnight covered her skin and turned towards the others. Good job, you three. Let's take them towards the front. The same thing occurred throughout all sections of the USJ until none of the villains were left standing. When they all arrived at the front, they found the policemen taking testimonies and questioning everyone, while a line of marching villains were being escorted out by them. Momo found Tony and Melissa. Waving to them, she went to make sure they were all right. Are the two of you okay? You guys didn't get injured, right? Us? Get injured? Come on, Momo, you should know us by now. Do you really expect me, of all people, to be injured? 
Tony smugly said. Melissa only had an amused look as she shook her head. She's only asking because she's worried about us. And yes, Momo, we're all right. We didn't get injured. Momo scratched the back of her head, a bit embarrassed. It was then Melissa's turn to ask about her. How about you? Are you okay? Tony then intervened as he asked, so, did you kick ass? Did you have fun? Momo chuckled at Tony's question. She looked towards Melissa, smiling as she said, I'm fine. I'm not injured. She then turned towards Tony and put her hands on her hips. I did indeed kick ass. Even if I don't like to use such language to describe it as such, she said proudly. Tamura and Kirojiri stumbled out of purple mist portals and landed in the middle of their bar, taking a few seats and a table down with them. Kirojiri groaned in pain, lacking the energy to stand, but Tamura managed to get up. He grabbed one of the chairs that had tumbled down with his entry and used it to help himself up, only for the chair to disintegrate into dust. Tamura grabbed the hand that was covering his face and threw it in frustration. Damn it! Damn them all! Curse those blasted heroes! All for one's cold voice was then heard. Tamura, calm down. Explain what happened. How did the mission go? Tamura stood in the middle of his messy bar, his knuckles paler than usual due to him tightening his fists. We failed the mission, he said through gritted teeth. AFO let out a disappointed sigh. I see. So All Might managed to stop you, even with all those gnomus. It wasn't All Might, Tamura said slowly. What? I said it wasn't. All Might. Watch your tone, boy, AFO said in a cold voice, causing Tamura to flinch slightly. Sorry. I was just frustrated. All Might wasn't even present during the ambush. What? AFO said his voice sounding a bit taken aback. Explain yourself. Are you saying you lost to a bunch of students? How? You had five gnomus with you, not to mention Kirojiri. Kirojiri, still on the floor, groaned out the answer to AFO's questions. The gnomus, they were taken down by two students. They're actually pretty popular. Tony Stark and his assistant slash partner Melissa Shield there was heavy tension in the air as AFO digested the information. From what my intel could gather, they were corkless, playing hero in a suit of armor. Are you saying they managed to take down weapons designed to take down S-Class heroes? My cork, it didn't work on their suits. They were indestructible. It didn't decay. And the one person that could have stopped my cork wasn't even looking at the time. There was another tense silence before they heard AFO sharply exhale. Tamura, you are going to need to start making some friends. Huh? Tamura asked, confused, unsure if he had heard AFO correctly. We will need to expand the League of Villains if what you are telling me is correct. You'll need comrades. You'll need help. There's... Tamura. AFO called out in a warning tone. Tamura looked down blood dripping from his hands due to his grip while he bit down on his lip. Now then, explain everything from the beginning, and do not leave anything out, AFO said. Although they couldn't see his face, both Kirojiri and Tamura knew he was displeased, and that was putting it lightly. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa were back in their labs after finishing their conversation with their parents. Is your dad still worried? Tony asked. Melissa sighed as she put her phone in her back pocket. Yeah, I had to convince him not to take a plane and come visit us. Tony chuckled. Yeah, my mom was the same. I had to get my father to calm her down, or else she would have flown the private plane herself. Melissa giggled at the idea before sighing. She put a hand on her hip and ruffled her long, curly blonde hair. Shall we review how our suits performed? Yup, Tony agreed. Let's start with the skin suits. Melissa nodded. Although they performed great, it just wasn't the same as wearing our normal armor. Tony nodded in agreement. Well, they were just a test, mostly ideas brought forth. Not all our ideas are going to turn out like we want them to. The sword and pistols are too lethal for hero work. These suits work better for stealth missions, where our normal suits would be too conspicuous, Melissa added. Now, Mark 30, Project Indestructible. What do you think about it? Tony asked. I'm still amazed you managed to make an indestructible metal. 
Melissa said with a sigh of awe. Near indestructible, Tony corrected. This metal still has its weaknesses. Melissa nodded. I remember, itself, right? Yup. I'm glad to see it worked against decay. So we know this armor won't disintegrate. The blue-haired guy was the one that did that to the school gates, right? Mem, he tried to use his cork on my armor, but it didn't work. Now then, for the bad sides of the armor, took too long to arrive. A lot could have happened in the 25 seconds it took to get to us. Well, it's not really the suit's fault. We were pretty far away. Not to mention the micro receivers worked as intended. Well, I will say a downside is how heavy the armor is. The thrusters in the elbows helped, though. Tony sat down in his chair and pulled Melissa to sit on his lap as they brainstormed ideas to make their suits more accessible. We can have our suits become like flying companions, Melissa said hesitantly. What? Tony asked, looking at her funny. Melissa blushed slightly. Here, she said as she reached over his desk, grabbed a stylus and began drawing. Tony just stared as she pushed her blonde hair behind her ear and began to explain. Tony! Melissa yelled, snapping her fingers to get his attention. Huh? What? Why are you yelling? Tony asked, shaking his head awake. I've been calling you for a minute, but you didn't respond. Tony, what is that I'm feeling by my butt? Melissa slowly asked. Tony rubbed his chin as he looked away. I think you know. Tony, Melissa called, her face turning slightly red. I plead the fifth, your honor. Tony covered his face, embarrassed. It's not my fault, all right? Then are you saying it's mine? Melissa said, covering her face as well, feeling just as embarrassed. All I'm saying is that the hair tucked to the ear was too much for my hormonal self. No one told you to be that pretty. Melissa slightly moved on his lap, causing Tony to simply hug her waist. You, young lady, are playing a very dangerous game. Melissa put her hand over Tony's as he held her by her waist. Let's wait like this until that thing calms down, Tony nodded as he put his chin over her shoulder while Melissa leaned back into him. There was a comfortable silence between them, which was quickly interrupted by Melissa asking, so I excite you? Huh? Not helping, Melissa. It's just nice to know, that's all, she said, giggling a bit, although she was still blushing. Melissa then turned around and kissed him. You're making it worse. Good to know, she said, kissing him again. Tony held the side of her face as Melissa had her hands around his neck and the back of his head. A few minutes later, they were both a bit breathless and back in the position they once were in. So shall we get back to this? Melissa asked as she straightened her hair and caught her breath. That sounds like a good idea, Tony said as he licked his lip and ran his thumb along its underside. So, as I was saying, which you weren't paying much attention to, we can make our suits fly around us like companions on standby. Friday will be the one in charge. She will be flying around us controlling it. And it will always be available when we need it most. Like Max Steel, Tony thought to himself. Tony nodded with an impressed look. That could definitely work. We can also make it so it would be able to attack without us being in it. We'll make it almost like a flying eye. The eye part will be the arc reactor, which Friday will be able to use and shoot repulsor beams when needed. If we are making two of them, then you will have an A.I of your own. Oh, an A.I solely for me. That sounds awesome, Melissa agreed. Friday, it appears you will be receiving a little sibling. Aren't you excited? Ecstatic, ma'am, Friday responded, causing Tony to chuckle. All right, we've already solved the time issue. We need a name for it. You come up with it since it was your idea, Tony said with a faint smile. Melissa put a hand on her chin and pondered. Mark 31, plus one, plus one, Tony asked with an are you sure expression. Yeah, since we will have our suits by our side like little companions, they'll be like our plus one. Hey, was it you or me that came up with this idea? I didn't say anything when you named Mark 29. Skin suit, Melissa pouted. Tony raised his hands in surrender. I didn't say anything. Like you said, your idea, your name. Melissa scoffed as she nodded. Luckily, 
We have three days since the school has decided to give us a break due to the villain attack. So we have time to experiment a bit. Is there anything else that we need to review? Yeah, Tony nodded. We will need a suit to fight underwater. Thanks to being thrown in the flood area of the USJ, it reminded me that although our suits are waterproof, we don't really have anything that fights underwater enemies. I see your point. Tony then had a teasing expression. Let's name it Mark 31. Water Buddy. Melissa looked at him with a straight expression, knowing he was making fun of her naming sense again. She grabbed his chin and gave it a little shake as she said, You're lucky you're cute. Thank you. It's one of my most redeeming qualities. Melissa playfully rolled her eyes as she still held his chin. Only next to your big ego, she said as she went and kissed him once more. Now, come on, we have new suits to make, Melissa said with a sensual smirk as she stood up. Third person's POV. Melissa's finger hovered over the enter button, before curling her finger into a fist and turning towards Tony, who was wearing his large safety goggles as he had a small flashlight inside his mouth, tinkering with what's in front of him. Tony, are you absolutely sure I can use the name? Won't it be better if we switch the name? Melissa asked with uncertainty. Tony shifted his goggles to his forehead and took the flashlight out his mouth. Melissa, that day he didn't just shield me, he also shielded you. You can use the name. Here, Tony said as he turned towards her. He put a hand on his chest and raised his other. I, Anthony Stark, give you Melissa Shield access to his name and use if you're A.I. As he was done then he looked at her with a raised brow. There, better right? Melissa sighed, I suppose so, she said with a faint smile, which she then hit the enter button. A status screen appeared with a process bar which quickly filled up. There was an activation noise as a male British voice introduced him. The letters J-R-V-I-S appeared on screen. Good even madam, I am Jarvis. Just a rather very intelligent system. The letters went in a row as he introduced himself. How am I be of any assistance? Hello Jarvis, I am Melissa Shield, and for now just be on standby for further notice, of course Jarvis responded. Melissa giddily started drumming on the table, are you hearing this, Tony? Loud and clear, dear Tony said with a smile of his own as he moved and connected wires around. Tony reached over and grabbed his arc reactor, he gave his arc reactor a flip in his hand before putting it in an empty socket, he twisted around like he was screwing in a light bulb which began buzzing with power soon after. Melissa grabbed a hard drive from the side of her computer. She pushed her seat out and rolled to the other side of the room where her plus one was currently at, connected to wires. Melissa opened up its side and inserted the hard drive. A hologram screen appeared close to it. Melissa tapped casually and gave it a few taps before another loading screen appeared. Installing personal aid at eye system. After getting the green light, Melissa took out the hard drive and started securing everything. Tony performed a last-minute system check and nodded. Everything is operational. Are you ready? Ah. Melissa was busy typing something before pushing everything away. Yup. I'm already. She said as she started disconnecting the excess wires. Tony and Melissa then tapped their watches, causing the machines at their respective stations to give a little shake as if they were just waking up. Tony had given their arc reactor eyes the ability to blink, which started off slowly. The one on Tony's desk was royal blue with golden accents and had flipper-like hands. Melissa's machine was similar except for being royal purple with golden accents. Both machines had small thrusters in the back that lifted them up from the tables. They swayed side to side slightly before stabilizing themselves. Friday, how are you doing? Tony asked. Friday flew close to Tony and started orbiting around him before she saluted. Everything seems to be in order, sir. And you, Jarvis? Melissa asked, watching him maneuver up and down and side to side. Everything is in order on my end, ma'am, Jarvis replied. Tony and Melissa then nodded towards each other. They both spread their arms and said, suits. In an instant, the machines transformed. Components shifted and expanded clicking into place with mechanical precision. The royal blue and royal purple machines began to reshape, encasing Tony and Melissa in their Iron Man suits. Plates of armor extended over their bodies, merging seamlessly until they stood fully suited and ready. 
The arc reactors, initially part of the machine's eyes, descended and embedded themselves into the chests of the suits, powering them up with a bright glow. The masks formed last, sliding over their faces and sealing with a hiss, the huds inside flickering to life. You just gotta love a cool suit-up sequence, Tony said, his voice now resonating with the suit's internal speakers. Let's test these upgrades, Melissa added, flexing her armored fingers. Shall we fight against one another? Tony asked with a slight smile. Yes, I have to test how Jarvis functions in a fight, Melissa instantly agreed. Friday window, Tony ordered. The windows from their lab started to open leading down towards the ocean making it a perfect runway for them. They both took a running position before they began sprinting towards the ocean. They both jumped and spun around as they started flying towards the middle of the ocean. The air around them became visible as they flew at high speeds. Once they were a safe distance away, Tony and Melissa faced off each other. You ready? Tony asked. For you? Always, Melissa said teasingly. They didn't say anything else as they began attacking one another. Tony and Melissa both made finger guns, the tips of their fingers glowing with different colors. Tony's fingers shimmered with an ice-cold blue, while Melissa's crackled with flames. In unison, they fired, the projectiles colliding mid-air and creating a massive steamy explosion that sent waves churning beneath them. They exchanged smirks as their thrusters hummed to life, propelling them toward each other. Upon meeting in the middle, the force of their combined power churned the ocean below. They engaged in close-quarters combat, trading powerful punches. The sound of metal clashing echoed across the empty expanse. Their suits began to show faint scratches, evidence of their fierce exchanges. Melissa expertly blocked one of Tony's punches, then quickly placed a hand on his stomach, unleashing a powerful repulsor beam that sent him spiraling backward. Regaining his balance mid-air, Tony shot toward her, opting for a kick instead of a punch. Thrusters ignited on his calves, enhancing the force of his attack. Melissa raised both arms to defend herself, but the kick plunged her into the depths of the ocean below, creating a massive splash. Emerging from the water, Melissa quickly recalibrated, her suit glowing as she activated her thermal vision to track Tony's movements. She spotted him hovering above, readying another attack. With a swift motion, she activated her fire-based repulsor beams, which they created using their previous ideas of the skin suit weapons, Melissa unleashing a torrent of flames aimed directly at him. Tony countered by diving into the ocean. As her flame repulsors hit the water, steam billowed up, creating a thick mist that obscured their vision. He seized the opportunity, appearing back above, darting through the steam, trying to flank her. But Melissa was ready. Using her own thrusters, she propelled herself out of the mist and twisted midair, launching a volley of explosive projectiles at the point where she predicted he would emerge. The ocean erupted in a series of explosive bursts, each explosion sending ripples across the surface. As the smoke cleared, Tony soared from the chaos, a determined look etched on his face. He grinned, recalibrating his targeting system. Nice moves, but it's time to kick it up a notch. He activated his suit's advanced targeting capabilities, locking onto her with precision. Melissa responded by engaging her suit's cloaking technology, becoming partially invisible as she repositioned herself. Tony scanned the area, his sensors on high alert. Suddenly, she burst from her hiding spot, her fists glowing with repulsor energy as she charged toward him. They collided in a fierce exchange of blows, the sound of metal clashing reverberating through the air. Each punch resonated with the strength of their suits, creating shockwaves that rippled through the water below. As they traded blows, both suits began to show signs of wear, scratches marring the once pristine armor. In a swift move, Tony blocked one of Melissa's punches and countered with a powerful uppercut, sending her reeling. As she stabilized, she activated her suit's propulsion system, launching herself into a spin and delivering a roundhouse kick aimed at his head. Tony narrowly dodged, using his own thrusters to propel himself backward and regain distance. He fired a series of targeted energy blasts from his palms, but Melissa deftly evaded, her suit's agility on full display. 
Melissa tackled Tony and activated her thrusters at full capacity, breaking the sonic barrier. Tony started to grunt as Melissa gave him a strong bear hug. Tony kept delivering punches toward her back and head as they flew. Melissa then slowed down significantly, and it wasn't long before they both crashed back into their lab. As they landed, they rolled and crashed into the entryway, ending up on the ground. Melissa was aimed down towards the open ocean, while Tony was facing up towards the lab. Both were looking towards the lights on the ceiling. When their masks lifted, they both had cuts on their lips. A long silence followed, broken by Tony asking, Wanna go on a date? Absolutely. Cool. It's a date then. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa were both dressed in casual but stylish clothing. Tony wore a nice red dress shirt with dress pants and dress shoes. He had his sleeves rolled up to his elbows, and his hair was combed back, with some bits poking out due to not being able to tame it. Melissa had light makeup on and wore a beautiful white frilly blouse tucked into a blue skirt with black leggings and heels. Her curly hair was tied in a ponytail with two strands hanging to her chin. Tony offered his hand. Are you ready, beautiful? Melissa slid her hand into his, smiling beautifully. For you, handsome? Always. Their fingers soon became interlocked. Tony then led her toward a limo, where he opened the door for her. Madam. Why, thank you, good sir, Melissa replied jokingly. As the limo began to drive itself, Melissa looked toward Tony. So where are you taking me? She asked with a happy grin. That, my beautiful mistress, is a surprise. Melissa went and sat on his lap, playfully rolling her finger around his chest. Are you sure I can't know about it? Tony grabbed her thigh, making her cross her leg a bit. He grabbed her chin and pulled her into a kiss. Sorry? Grand seductress, your techniques won't work on me. Melissa rested a finger sensually on his cheek. MMM. It appears so. That means I have to use everything I have to get this information out of you. Heh. Lucky for you. That's just what I wanted. They giggled as they softly kissed each other. Their bantering and little kisses continuing until they arrived at what appeared to be a high-stakes restaurant. Melissa looked out the window. When she read the name of the restaurant, she couldn't help but giggle and shake her head. Stark Restaurant. No matter how many times I see it, I can't help but laugh. Your naming sense is so original, Tony. Tony just looked proud of himself. What can I say? I need to stay on brand. The Stark name needs to be everywhere. When does it end? Melissa giggled. When it reaches your last name, Tony smirked as he casually reached over and opened the door. As he got out, he held out his hand. When she didn't come out, Tony looked inside and found Melissa covering her face. Bright red. Tony coughed into his fist, causing Melissa to slowly reach out her hand. She was fanning herself as they walked past the long line of well-dressed people. Some called for them to stop cutting, but Tony paid them no mind. Melissa covered her mouth a bit as her embarrassment died down slightly. The guards by the door bowed to Tony and Melissa. Mr. Stark, they greeted as they held the door open for him. Tony nodded and greeted them back, leaving those waiting in the long line looking a bit shocked. There was a beautiful woman sitting by a podium with a tablet in hand. When she looked toward Tony and Melissa, she nodded in greeting and headed toward an elevator. She led them to the highest floor with a beautiful view of the city at night. There was a large area with a man wearing a chef's outfit with six arms. Each hand held a cooking utensil. Is he going to be cooking right in front of us? Yes, he is. Tony smiled proudly. They both sat down in front of the man. He bowed towards them before clanging his spatulas together. Good evening, Mr. Stark and Ms. Shield. I will be your chef for the evening. I am Hashima, at your service. We'll be in your care then, Tony and Melissa replied with a polite Japanese bow. Hashima smiled as he nodded. He used one of his free hands to grab ingredients and toss them onto the open stove. He spread his arms and took a deep breath before he began rapidly chopping the ingredients. Tony's and Melissa's heads moved back and forth, both entertained. The smell of the food, the heat from the stove warmly hitting their faces, and the performance. All the little things added together made it enjoyable. As Hashima's hands rapidly moved, 
he stopped and held a piece of food on a spatula. For the young miss, are you ready? Melissa nodded, grinning and looking at the piece intently. Hashima flicked his wrist, causing the food to fly in the air. Melissa moved her head as she followed its movement before jumping up and biting it out of the air. Tony and Hashima both had small smiles on their faces, seeing her proud expression as they both began clapping. And now for the young mister. You ready? Like last time, Hashima flicked his wrist, causing it to fly. Tony casually caught it before winking at Melissa, causing her to giggle and Hashima to gain an amused look. They repeated the action a few times before Hashima neatly arranged their food on plates and put them in front of them. Enjoy? Ida de Kamasu, Tony and Melissa said as they clasped their hands together. They immediately loved it, talking happily as they ate. They discussed many things throughout the night. They even received seconds and third portions due to how good the food was. Melissa cleaned her face with a napkin, leaned back in her seat, and held her stomach. I don't think I can eat another bite. I know what you mean, Tony said as he patted his chest and took a sip of his drink. The food was amazing, Mr. Hashima, Melissa thanked. Tony made the okay sign with his hand and a satisfied expression. It brings me great joy that you two had a wonderful experience. Hashima bowed. Tony looked towards Melissa and smirked. I know a great place to wash this food down. There's more to our date? Melissa asked, surprised. But of course, Tony scoffed. They both got up, and Tony brought out his phone and quickly typed something out. When they said their goodbyes and were leaving Hashima, they heard him shout, 100 million yen, as the elevator doors closed in front of them. Melissa looked at Tony and shook her head with a smile. You're too much sometimes, you know that? She said as she leaned on his shoulder. Literally pocket change, Tony scoffed as he interlocked their hands together. They returned to their limo, which soon drove off and later arrived at a beach with a lovely house. Melissa leaned towards Tony, looking at him with a playful, loving expression. You are so cheesy and cute sometimes. We literally have a beach at home where we can have our little beach moonlight walk. I know, but it's the novelty of it not being our home and being away that makes it special, Tony smirked. I suppose you have a point, Melissa nodded. They both walked out and began strolling on the sandy beach, reminiscing about their childhood as they walked under the soft moonlight. Oh please, you were much more clumsy than I was, Melissa scoffed. Need I remind you of how, when you tried to upgrade the repulsor beams, you made it too strong and went flying back into the wall, knocking yourself unconscious? Tony covered his face as he laughed. Oh, I remember. You went crying to my mom and dad thinking I killed myself. Haha, what about you trying to upgrade the thrusters? Need I remind someone of how they lost their last set of baby teeth? In my defense, I activated those thrusters at their usual capacity. I failed to account that since they were upgraded, that capacity would send me flying. Melissa raised her hand defensively as she giggled. It wasn't long before they both took off their shoes and socks and began walking by the shore, wetting their feet. Melissa held her heels and stockings in the air as they both laughed and kicked the water, wetting their feet. After a while, Tony saw Melissa shiver a bit. He crouched down in front of her and held his arms to the side. Come, I'll carry you inside. Melissa happily giggled as she jumped onto his back. Tony took hold of her thighs as he led her towards the house in the far distance. Melissa held his neck with one arm and pointed forward. Onward, my steed. Our adventure has just begun, she shouted before laughing. Tony chuckled, yes, my princess, he said sarcastically as he shook his head. As he was carrying her, she softly leaned her cheek on his. Both arms wrapped around his neck as she happily kicked her feet and softly swayed. There was a beautiful silence between them as they both smiled in contentment. Hey, Tony, Melissa softly asked. MMM, Tony hummed. I love you. Melissa said as she kissed his cheek and leaned towards him. And I love you just as much, Melissa. If not even more. Mmm. Doubt it. No, no. I'm pretty sure I love you more. I'm not so sure. I'm certain I love you more. But you see, that can't be possible. Since I love you more. So by the equation, no matter how much you love me, I will always love you more, Tony said triumphantly. 
This caused them both to start chuckling and giggling as they went inside the house. Third person's POV. When they entered, it appeared to be a nice two-story house, a beautiful home for a family. As they closed the door behind them, Melissa jumped from his back and tossed her shoes to the side. She grabbed Tony's shoes and did the same. She grabbed his hand and began walking up the stairs. Melissa, where are you taking me? Tony asked as he watched Melissa peek inside some of the doors before closing it and going to the next one. Melissa didn't respond, but he saw how her turning red. Melissa then opened the last door in the hall and pulled Tony inside. When he looked around, he saw they were in the master bedroom. As Tony turned around and closed the door behind him, Melissa leaned her head on his back and grabbed the back of his shirt. Tony stared at the door as he asked, Melissa, we don't have to do this if you don't want to. You know? Tony felt Melissa nodded before speaking in a soft tone. I know, but I want to do it. I'm just a bit nervous. Sorry? Why are you even apologizing? Tony asked as he shook his head and sighed. He turned around to which Melissa just leaned forward on his chest. He grabbed her face as he asked, Are you sure you want to do this? Melissa batted her eyes shyly as she nodded her head before looking down. Tony made her look him in the eyes, studying her expression. As they stared at each other, Melissa started going on her tiptoes as Tony held her face and lowered his head, both of them slowly closing their eyes. Their lips met softly and Melissa was immediately reminded of how much bigger Tony was than her. But in his arms and with his body against hers, she didn't feel threatened. Instead, she felt safe and comforted. She reached over and wrapped her arms around his neck as his arms went around her lower back. He pulled her to him and she felt her breasts press against his chest. They slowly walked towards the empty bed as they continued their passionate kiss. Third person's POV. Melissa batted her eyes as she slowly woke up, finding herself laying on Tony's chest with his arms around her. She simply closed her eyes again, listening to his resting heartbeat and finding comfort in its sound. They were back in their own home. Since crossing that line together, they had decided to sleep together from now on. They were then woken up by alarms flaring around them, causing Tony to wake up as well. The door to their room opened, and in came Friday and Jarvis flying in. It's time to get up, sir and madam. You have school, Friday and Jarvis both said. Tony groaned and laid his head back down, kissing Melissa on the top of her head, causing her to sigh as well. They both then got up and got themselves ready to go back to school. After eating their breakfast, they were on their motorbike with their helmets ready. Both Jarvis and Friday soon turned invisible as they floated by their side, always ready for when Tony and Melissa might need them. And with that, they went on their way. As they arrived and went into their classroom, they greeted their friends and sat down as Aizawa soon entered the room. Unlike the anime, this time Aizawa was okay with a small bandage here and there. He stood in front of the class, his face as apathetic as always. I hope you guys enjoyed your rest, because we're just getting started. Our fight is far from over, Aizawa said. Everyone mostly looked at him in confusion assuming he was referring to fighting more villains. UA's sports festival is fast approaching, he said as his eyes narrowed. It's something normal, some of them shouted, as Aizawa's apathetic expression didn't help in guessing what he was referring to. We were just attacked by villains. Is it okay to hold the sports festival? One student asked. It's necessary to demonstrate that UA's crisis management protocol is sound. It is to show people that even when attacked by villains, UA stands strong and isn't affected. Well, that's the thinking, apparently. Compared to the previous year, there will be heightened security. The UA Sports Festival is an event that must go on. It is the greatest opportunity you will receive. It will not be stopped by a couple of villains. Some students were unsure of Aizawa's statement. The UA Sports Festival is Japan's biggest event. As far as Japan's concerned, it has taken over the Olympics. The nation's top heroes will be watching. They will be scouting you guys. Naturally, you'll gain popularity if you're picked by a high-ranking hero. But your time will be limited. Show the high-rankers what you guys are made of, and you will make a future for yourselves. This happens once a year. If you're hoping to become a hero, this is an event you can't miss. Everyone had a serious expression after Aizawa finished giving his speech. 
as he had set the tone for the upcoming event. After his speech, their classes continued as normal, then came lunchtime. Everyone was still affected by Aizawa's speech. This has gotten me so freaking pumped, Kirishima said as his hands hardened. Kaminari turned toward Tony and saw him slouching in his seat. You don't seem that affected by the sports festival. Are you not excited? I am and I'm not, since even if I perform poorly, I will still receive many applications from high-ranking heroes. What? Are you serious? Mina replied, shocked. Tony just nodded. Yup. My name holds a lot of weight in the public eye. So heroes having said to work with a Stark will receive a boost of popularity. Not to mention, they will believe they will get benefits from Stark Industries personally if they can get me to accept. Just how popular are you? Ajui asked, tilting her head in confusion. For your name to have such an effect, you must be insanely popular. I'm popular for good and bad reasons. Well, Melissa is fairly popular as well, Tony said. We too are the first corkless people to ever be accepted into a hero school. Some believe I bribed my way in with Melissa, and then there's the half that doesn't. Tony and Melissa were seating on top of their invisible suits, floating out toward lunch. As they made their way, they heard Midoriya asking Eurarika, Why do you want to be a hero? Eurarika grew a bit shy. Well, it's mostly for money. You want to be a hero for money? Both Midoriya and Ida looked at Eurarika in shock. Eurarika rubbed the back of her head, a bit embarrassed. Ultimately, yeah. She then began to blush and hold her face. Sorry, I know it seems base and really embarrassing considering Ida's noble goal of following in his brother's footsteps. Ida and Midoriya both tried to reassure her that there was nothing wrong with wanting to live a comfortable life. My family runs a construction company, but business is poorer than poor. Please don't mention it to anyone else, Eurarika said. Sorry, we didn't mean to eavesdrop, Tony said as he scratched his cheek. Wah! Eurarika yelped in embarrassment, covering her face. We really didn't mean to eavesdrop. We were just making our way toward lunch, Melissa added. Hey, Eurarika, Tony called out. Yeah, she replied holding her face that was bright red. Of course your reason for wanting to be a hero sounds shallow if you worded it like that, Tony said, shaking his head. Uh, Eurarika, Midoriya, and Ida responded. You don't want to be a hero for money, Tony rolled his eyes. You want to be a hero to make your parents live a comfortable life, a life they deserve, right? Eurarika nodded her head in confirmation. Filial piety is something I consider very noble, Tony said. With that, I agree, Melissa nodded. Midoriya and Ida also nodded, showing they agreed with Tony's statement. So even if you didn't realize it, you want to be a hero for a very noble reason, Tony said. Eurarika looked down a bit as she blushed, her lips slowly forming into a smile. Thank you, she expressed with gratitude. How are you guys floating? She asked, as it finally clicked that they were just calmly sitting in the air. Ida and Midoriya blinked and tilted their heads in confusion, trying to figure out how they were doing it. Tony and Melissa calmly tapped on the air below them, which had a metallic ring to it. Both Friday and Jarvis flashed slightly before turning invisible once more. It's our suits we're sitting on, Melissa said proudly. They continued talking about it as they made their way to lunch, but before they could arrive, All Might peeked his head out. Young Midoriya, I have found you. All Might happily said as he held a lunchbox in his hand. Want to have lunch with me? Eurarika covered her mouth, trying not to laugh as All Might sounded like a schoolgirl. Hey, Uncle Might, Melissa greeted. Why, hello there, young Melissa. All Might greeted her as well. Want to join me as well? Melissa looked toward Tony, who just looked at her weirdly. Why are you looking at me? It's not like you need my permission. Tony rolled his eyes. Melissa blushed slightly as she rubbed the back of her head. Sure, I'll join you too. Melissa and Midoriya then both followed All Might as Tony accompanied Eurarika and Ida to lunch. Third person's POV. As school came to an end and everyone was preparing to leave, they were met with a horde of students from different departments waiting outside their doors, taking most of them by surprise. What is going on? Eurarika asked as she opened the door. There's no way out. What are they even doing here? 
Mineta mumbled. Bakugo, seeing this, scoffed, isn't it obvious? They're here to scope out the competition. Duh. Because we're the kids who survived the villain attack. Makes sense they'd want to check us out. Tony then walked up front with a hand over Melissa's shoulders, wearing sunglasses indoors and sporting an arrogant look. All right, all right, everyone, calm down. I'll sign the autographs. Bring them here. He motioned with his free hand while walking past Bakugo, who looked at him in annoyance. His annoyance grew as he saw some actually pass Tony things to sign. I better not see these for sale online. I'll sue, Tony teased. Move out of the way, you extra cannon fodders, Bakugo yelled. Please stop calling people extras and cannon fodders. It'll give us a bad rep. Not to mention that's not how heroes are supposed to act, Ida said, moving his arms robotically. It's true that we came to have a look, but you guys sure are modest. Are all of you like that, or is it just him? Someone said from the back. He slowly came to the front of the crowd revealing purplish hair with bags under his eyes. Gotta say, I'm a little disillusioned if this is all you're offering. Those of us who didn't make the hero course are stuck in general studies and other tracks. There are quite a few of us, actually. So where do you want me to sign? Tony asked with a marker in hand. Shinso only tilted his head in confusion. You're a fan, right? Tony smirked as he twirled the pen in his hand. I mean, you must be. Here you are complaining about being stuck in general studies and not making the hero course. But you see, I'm corkless and I still made it. So I must be a huge inspiration for you guys. Shinso narrowed his eyes at Tony. With the way you're behaving, I take it all of class 1A is arrogant and it wasn't only him. Do you know that depending on the results of the sports festival, they might consider transferring some of us to the hero course? Of course, the reverse is also possible for you. Tony lifted his glasses and looked surprised before turning to Mineta. You hear that, Mineta? Your spot can be taken. You better train hard. What? Why mine? That's just mean, you rich bastard. Mineta glared at Tony with a scared expression. Tony just let his glasses fall back to his face, and Melissa covered her mouth lightly, trying not to laugh. Shinso just looked around the classroom at all of Class 1A, I wasn't talking about a singular person. This was a warning to everyone. This is the perfect chance to knock you off your pedestal. Consider this a declaration of war. This guy is so intense, most of them thought. All right, Aizawa's secret love child, if you're done with your little speech, please move out of the way. Some of us actually have something useful to do with our time available. Well, unless you still need me to sign something. If that's the case, I'll ask again. Where do I sign? He said, emphasizing every word and twisting his marker again with a smirk. Tony is just as intense. Please stop riling him up. They all secretly wished. Someone from the crowd then shouted, Hey, I'm from Class 1B next door. I heard you guys fought villains and wanted to find out more. But all I'm seeing are arrogant bastards. Another one, they all lamented. You guys better not make fools of the hero course at this thing says Class 1. Everyone from Class 1 had jumped in and covered Tony's mouth. Even Melissa joined in covering his mouth. Seeing Tony's confused look, they all then shouted, Please stop making U.S. enemies. Bakugo just walked up to the mob of people and started forcing them apart. And what are you doing? They asked. Leaving. I don't care what they have to say. All I'm doing is heading for the top. Nothing else should matter, Bakugo calmly said. After a bit of difficulty, they all soon began exiting the school. Momo, Mina, Kirishima, Kaminari, and Jiro were seen with Tony and Melissa. Jiro recently joined after getting closer with Momo and Kaminari after the villain attack. Why do you like to antagonize people? Melissa asked, shaking her head in amusement one. Their response is always funny. And two, I'm bored of always winning. I need more enemies in my life. Yeah, but do we need to be implicated as well? Momo asked with an awkward expression. Yes, yes you do. After all, the only way to grow is through the challenges placed in front of you. As the class president, it is my job to make sure you all receive those challenges. Huh. 
Was that the real reason you were making enemies for us left and right? Mina asked in surprise. Yup. Tony smiled as he gave her a peace sign with his tongue slightly out of his mouth. Man, the way you work and think is scary, Kaminari said, shaking his head, with Jiro nodding in agreement. I see, so they are a way for us to grow stronger. Awesome, Kirishima said, sounding excited. Not awesome. I don't want to make enemies out of everyone, Mina said worriedly. Too bad, Tony said as he snapped his fingers towards her before getting on his bike. Can I come with you guys? Your place is the best place to train for the upcoming sports festival, Momo asked. Sure, just hop on, Tony said, motioning behind Melissa, who had her arms wrapped around him. No, I'll just follow you in my limo, Momo shook her head. Tony just handed her his helmet. Stop being such a wuss and hop on already, Momo sighed as she reached down to her leg and pulled out a helmet. Right, you can do that, I forgot. Tony said as he put on his helmet and Momo went and sat behind Melissa. Tony then looked at the others and saw their looks, causing him to rest his arms on the handles of his bike and sigh. You guys want to come but don't want to seem like a bother or a nuisance by asking me. Don't you? They all began blushing, pretty embarrassed for being caught. Tony wasn't bothered and had an amused look at their embarrassment as he rolled his eyes. Fine, Momo has been the only other person that has come over so it could be fun but it has to be tomorrow so I can prepare some things. Friday, send them the address. All of their phones then chimed as Tony made his motorcycle roar. He lowered his visor as he looked towards them. Remember, tomorrow. Be there or be square, he said as he began driving away. Third person's POV. The next day, Friday hovered around Tony, holding a tool kit as he tightened a screw. Boss, your company has already arrived, Friday informed him, causing Tony to put the screwdriver down. Thanks, Friday, Tony said as he went to greet everyone. Friday took the toolbox off her head and followed Tony around as he grabbed a towel to clean his hands. The doorbell rang. I'm coming. I'm coming. Don't get your panties in a twist, Tony said as he opened the door to find Momo with Kirishima, Kaminari, Mina, and Jiro. Momo was blushing slightly. Your language is always so crass. Tony rolled his eyes, throwing the towel over his shoulder. Anyways, come on in. Sorry for not looking presentable. I was working on something. Thanks for the invite, they said, bowing politely as they made their way inside. Make yourself at home, Tony said, gesturing around himself. Whoa, this house is so nice, Mina said spinning in a circle and looking upwards. You know, people usually say that after they see the entirety of the house. Not just the ceiling, Tony teased. We don't need to see the entire house to say this place is very nice. Kaminari nodded in agreement with Mina. Well, of course it's nice. I designed it. Now come, I'll give you guys a tour. As Tony guided them around, he looked at Momo in confusion. You've already seen the place. Why are you going along with the tour? Momo grew embarrassed. I was going along with the flow. I didn't know when was the best time to leave. Tony almost facepalmed as he shook his head. So, do you guys want anything to eat or drink? My maid could quickly make it. You have a maid? Kaminari asked excitedly, causing the other girls to look at him weirdly. Kaminari leaned in and whispered, Is she beautiful? The prettiest, Tony whispered back. Here, take a look. Baymax. Hearing this, Momo covered her mouth, trying not to laugh. Baymax. Kaminari wondered. They soon heard squeaky footsteps. When Baymax appeared, he was wearing a maid outfit with a little maid hat and holding a duster. He did his little hand greeting. Hello. I am Baymax, your personal maid for the duration of your stay. Jiro stifled a laugh. She's the prettiest thing I've ever seen. Kaminari dropped to all fours looking at Tony with tears in his eyes. You have the heart of the devil. How can you trick me like that? If you guys want to drink or eat anything, and I mean anything, ask Baymax. He will be able to get you anything. Anything? Anything? Mina asked mischievously. Tony had a confident smirk. Try it. Mina put a hand on her chin as she pondered. All right, I'll test this out. Baymax, may I have a milkshake that's a quadruple decker? 
half chocolate, half vanilla, with a twist of strawberry and a hint of mint, layered with chunks of cookie dough, sprinkles of caramel, and a swirl of marshmallow. Top it off with a dollop of whipped cream, but only the organic kind, drizzled with both hot fudge and salted caramel. Add a sprinkle of crushed pistachios, a dash of nutmeg, and precisely three maraschino cherries on top. Oh, and it needs to be served in a vintage-style glass with a curly straw that's in the shape of a heart. Please and thank you, Mina said challengingly. As you wish, Baymax bowed and waddled towards the kitchen. Is it weird that I want to hug it? Hiroshima mumbled. He is very soft and huggable. Momo nodded with a large smile. Just know you aren't alone in those feelings. The kitchen then began to sound like a war zone. Is he all right in there? Jiro asked awkwardly. Not a minute later, Baymax walked out with a tray in hand, holding Mina's exact order. Mina's mouth was slightly agape as Baymax presented it to her. Thank you, she answered in shock. She took a sip from the curly heart straw and squealed, so good, before drinking more. Baymax continued to look at her, waiting with his tray in hand, causing her to look at him in confusion. He won't leave your side until you are finished and say you are satisfied with his services, Tony explained. Mina nodded in understanding. Momo then asked, you said you were working on something. What was it? Oh, nothing serious. I'm building a jet. If it works as intended, it could fly me to America in under an hour. You're building a jet? They all shouted. I'm right here. Literally no need to yell. Tony rolled his eyes. Come, I'll show you guys. As Tony began guiding everyone towards his workshop, Jiro asked, Hey, where's Melissa? Ah, she's currently training. She's pretty excited about the sports festival. She is? Hiroshima asked in confusion. Tony nodded. Yup. She believes this will be the best opportunity to show everyone that she isn't only an assistant, that she herself is very skillful. Kaminari looked confused. From what I heard, Melissa fought really well against the villains and those monsters. What else does she need to prove? That information isn't available to the public. Mostly everyone believes Melissa is where she is today simply because of me. Which isn't entirely wrong. But it isn't right either. She is where she is mostly due to her hard work. The others nodded in understanding. As they reached his workshop, they were all amazed. Everything appeared as if it was made from a sci-fi movie. What amazed them even more were all of his suits on display. Whoa, those are a lot, Kaminari said in awe. It's cool. It's like seeing age progression by the heights of the suits, Mina said, still holding her milkshake. Some of the designs are just so manly. They all began looking and studying the suits, forgetting the reason they were down there in the first place, except for Momo, who shook her head with a smile. Tony leaned over and said, I just wanted to say, you were the same way when you came here. Momo got a bit shy. I know, I know. So shall we see that jet you're making? She asked, drawing back the other's attention. Tony nodded and guided everyone to where he was working before they arrived. They passed through a door leading to a hangar. In the middle was a large metal framework of a jet, appearing to later be able to fit many people. This is obviously just the framework, but you can see where I'm heading with this. They nodded, unsure what to say, simply amazed. This is the part where you all praise me for how amazing and gifted I am. Tony smirked. Half of them scoffed in amusement, while the other half nodded in agreement. Tony's expression then got serious. Now then, the real reason you guys came here, to train. Be ready. You're about to feel a lot of pain. They all gulped at his serious expression until he smirked. Kidding, they sighed in relief. After I'm done, you won't be able to feel much at all. He smirked sinisterly. Some of them began to second-guess their decision to come over. Third person's POV. Tony led everyone to a training room he had prepared while Momo went to train with Melissa. I've prepared this room just for you guys since I knew you'd be coming. The room had sections suited to train each of their individual quirks. By the entrance were black bodysuits made from unstable molecule fibers. I know you guys brought clothes to train in, but the suits will adapt to your quirks and are very comfortable if I might add. There's a girl slash boy changing room, so get changed. Yes, sir. They all saluted, causing Tony to roll his eyes. 
When they returned, Jiro looked at Tony weirdly, causing him to look at her in confusion. What? How do you know our sizes? The suits change and stretch to fit you all perfectly, no matter your size. That's what makes them able to adapt to your quirk. Look, Hiroshima, Harden, Hiroshima did as he was told and hardened his arm. His sleeve turned to match the hardness of his arm. Cool, Hiroshima said as he examined it. I see, sorry, Jiro said, a bit embarrassed. Wait, does that mean my clothes won't melt off? Mina asked. She started secreting acid from her arm and, seeing that her clothes were okay and that the acid was safely secreted from her skin, she nodded, impressed. Tony then looked at all of them. I'm going to be training both your bodies and quirks at the same time. Tony stopped as he saw Mina raise her hand. Yeah, I'm not trying to sound ungrateful or anything, but why are you helping us train? Are you worried we might beat you in the sports festival? One, I gained something by helping you train, and two, absolutely not. No matter how much you improve, so will I. So, you guys have no chance of beating me. Wow, you sure are confident. Kaminari said, shaking his head. Hiroshima then raised his hand, wanting to ask a question as well. We're not in school. You don't have to raise your hand to ask me a question. Sorry, Hiroshima said, smiling a bit embarrassed. What do you get for helping us, if you don't mind me asking? I'm studying your quirk factors, Tony said, his expression turning serious. I want to see how they react when you train, when you use your quirks, when you grow stronger, how they react to your physical training, etc. As someone who's quirkless, I find quirks to be really fascinating. I'm not jealous of them or anything, but they are very interesting, Tony explained. They were a bit lost but understood that Tony was benefiting from their training. If I study them enough, I should be able to build cuffs that block people from activating their quirks. If I could, I would study Aizawa's quirk, but this will do for now, he thought. Let me explain my ideas about how you should train your quirks for today. Jiro, with how you move your earphone jacks, that means they have some kind of muscle to them. I want you to train those muscles and see how strong you can make them. Kaminari, you will be releasing your electricity into those batteries over there. We are going to see how much lightning you can release without dumbing yourself. Then, we'll see if you can build resistance to short-circuiting. Mina, you will be training to see the different types of acid you can produce and how strong you can make them without hurting yourself. And Kirishima, I will be beating the living shit out of you. Yippee! Ha! Huh? Kirishima asked. We'll be sparring against each other. Apart from training everyone's quirks and physiques, I will be teaching you a bit of martial arts as a thank you for letting me study you. Tony said as he pulled out heavy silver metal fingerless gloves and put them on. Now then, we can all begin. Everyone went to do as they were told while Kirishima and Tony stood face to face. I would harden if I were you, Tony advised. I don't want to hurt you. Tony sighed and rolled his eyes before rushing towards Kirishima, taking him by surprise. Kirishima quickly crossed his arms in front of him, hardening as Tony threw an overshoulder punch. The sound of metal hitting hardened skin rang throughout the room as Kirishima slid back slightly. He looked at his trembling arms in surprise before smirking, thinking, looks like I was worried for nothing, and hardened his entire body, charging towards Tony. Tony sidestepped swiftly, using his enhanced reflexes to dodge Kirishima's charge. He landed a precise jab to Kirishima's side, the impact resonating through the room. Kirishima grunted but kept moving forward, swinging a hardened fist towards Tony. Tony ducked under the punch, grabbing Kirishima's arm and using his momentum to flip him over onto the ground. Kirishima groaned, quickly getting back up and launching another attack. Tony met him with a series of rapid punches, each one landing on Kirishima's hardened body with a resounding clang. Despite Kirishima's impressive durability, Tony's metal gloves and enhanced strength began to take their toll. Hiroshima swung again, but Tony caught his fist, twisting his arm and forcing him down to one knee. You're tough, Hiroshima, but you need more than just hardening to win battles, Tony said, his voice calm yet firm. Hiroshima struggled for a moment before yielding, realizing he couldn't overpower Tony. All right, you win, he admitted, his voice filled with respect. 
Tony released him and offered a hand to help him up. Good fight. You've got potential, just need to refine your strategy a bit. Kirishima took his hand and stood up, nodding. Thanks, man. Now then, again, Tony said, immediately going on the offensive. Kirishima barely had time to react before Tony was upon him, throwing a series of quick, powerful punches. Kirishima hardened his body again, bracing himself for the onslaught. Each punch landed with a metallic clang, echoing through the room. This time, Kirishima tried to counterattack more strategically, aiming to catch Tony off guard. He managed to land a solid punch on Tony's side, but Tony barely flinched, using the momentum to pivot and deliver a swift kick to Kirishima's knee, forcing him off balance. Kirishima stumbled but quickly recovered, launching himself at Tony with a renewed determination. Tony sidestepped, grabbing Kirishima's arm and twisting it behind his back, then swept his legs out from under him, sending him to the ground once more. Kirishima lay on the floor, panting, but his spirit wasn't broken. He pushed himself up, ready to continue. Tony watched him with a nod. All right, let's see what you've got, he said, settling into a defensive stance. Kirishima took a deep breath, his body hardening to its maximum once more. He charged at Tony with renewed vigor, aiming to overwhelm him with sheer force. Tony sidestepped, dodging the initial attack, but Kirishima was quick to adapt, swinging around with a backhanded punch. Tony blocked the punch with his metal-clad forearm, the impact resonating through the room. Good, you're adapting, Tony said, nodding in approval. But don't just rely on your strength. Kirishima grinned, launching a series of rapid punches at Tony, who expertly blocked and dodged each one. Tony then saw an opening and delivered a swift uppercut to Kirishima's jaw, momentarily stunning him. Taking advantage of the moment, Tony grabbed Kirishima's arm, twisted it, and used his momentum to flip him over his shoulder. Kirishima hit the ground hard, but he quickly rolled to his feet, his determination undiminished. I won't give up that easily, Kirishima declared, charging at Tony once more. This time, Tony decided to test Kirishima's reflexes. He feinted a punch to the left, then quickly shifted to the right, aiming a kick at Kirishima's side. Kirishima managed to block the kick with his forearm but was pushed back by the force. You're getting better, Tony said, moving fluidly as he continued his assault. But you need to be unpredictable. Make me guess your next move. Kirishima nodded, focusing on Tony's movements. He tried to anticipate Tony's attacks, adjusting his stance and using his hardening quirk more strategically. When Tony went for another punch, Kirishima deflected it and countered with a swift elbow strike to Tony's ribs. Tony grunted, feeling the impact even through his body armor. Nice one, he said, stepping back to reassess. He then lunged forward with a flurry of punches and kicks, testing Kirishima's defenses. Kirishima held his ground blocking and parrying as best as he could. Despite the intense pressure, he managed to land a few solid hits on Tony, who nodded in approval each time. Finally, Tony stepped back, holding up a hand. That's enough for now, he said, breathing heavily. You've made a lot of progress. Kirishima, equally winded, grinned widely. Thanks, I didn't expect to have as much fun as I did. Tony only smiled as he nodded and made Kirishima take a break. He then began teaching the others how to fight with their quirks, focusing on Mina and Jiro, who needed the most help. They stayed until it began getting dark. They all said their thanks and goodbyes before going home. When they all left, Tony rolled his shoulders and cracked his neck. At least it's a good workout for me as well. Now to work on the Quinton jet. Tony, is everyone gone? Melissa shouted from upstairs. Yep, yeah. it's just you and me, he shouted back. As he took a step toward his lab, he froze at Melissa's next words. That's good, since I was kind of hoping you would join me up here. For some fun activities, Tony immediately turned around, his facial expression turning serious. Duty calls, he said as he began speed walking toward Melissa. The jet can freaking wait. Third person's POV. A week and a few days later, Tony stood in front of a large black jet with folded wings, 
a wrench in hand, and wiped the sweat from his brow with a sigh of relief. He looked over at Melissa, who also looked tired and glared at her. If someone wasn't constantly interrupting me, I would have finished this earlier. Melissa rolled her eyes. Oh please, like you didn't enjoy every second of it. Or are you going to tell me that you didn't? She raised an eyebrow, giving him a warning look. I didn't say all that, he muttered. All I'm saying is that you can be a bit distracting. In a very good, pleasurable type of way, Melissa scoffed, beginning to blush. So, now that you're done and it's getting late, we can go to sleep, right? But I wanted to test out the Quinton Jet, QJ, Tony said, admiring his work of art. You can do that tomorrow. We have to pick up our parents anyway since they wanted to see the sports festival in person. You do have a point. So let's shower together before going to bed? Tony asked. That idea might just have been the best one you had all day. Melissa smirked as they began chuckling and giggling. The next day, Tony and Melissa were seen entangled in each other's limbs, woken up by Friday and Jarvis, who appeared larger than last time due to their upgrades. Boss Mun, you have to wake up, Friday said, shaking Tony awake. Tony groaned. It's too early. You have to so you can go and get your families and return in time for the sports festival. Friday reminded him, causing him to groan in annoyance. Tony and Melissa both got up and took a strong shower to eliminate the lingering scent of their previous activities. They quickly got ready and appeared in front of the QJ. They quickly got in, and Melissa started appreciating the interior design. They both went and sat in the pilot seats, buckled up, and began flicking switches. Tony was the main pilot while Melissa was the co-pilot. The wings of the jet started unfolding and straightening themselves. The walls in front of them started lifting up and opening. From the outside, it appeared that part of the cliff moved out of the way. All systems are in check, Melissa said as the large thrusters heated and activated. We are ready for takeoff. Roger that, Tony said as he pushed forward. The jet started moving forward and picking up speed before it blasted off from the side of the cliff. The sea parted away as they took off and as they broke the sound barrier, Tony pulled the controls, causing the jet to move upwards at high speed. Once they pierced the clouds, Melissa announced, commencing stealth mode, and the jet began to disappear from sight. Once they were invisible and heading toward America, Tony flipped on autopilot. Friday, wake us up if anything unusual happens. Record everything. I'll review the footage later, Tony said as he pulled a lever on the seat which inclined his chair. Good idea, Melissa said. Realizing he was going to use this chance to sleep, she followed his movements and reclined in her seat as well. Howard, David, and Maria stood in a large patio with their luggage in hand. Looking upward, Howard checked his watch. They should be arriving any minute now. When he looked up, he saw the QJ appearing above them. Its thrusters aimed up as it began to descend. Tony never fails to impress, Howard said in surprise. David nodded in agreement as they watched the jet land softly with its back turned towards them. As it opened, Tony and Melissa began walking out, Tony's arm around Melissa's shoulder as he yawned, Melissa doing the same. Hey guys, Tony and Melissa greeted as they all hugged each other. Tony, what is that? Howard asked interested in the jet. As Tony and Melissa helped carry their bags inside, Tony explained his creation and its capabilities, including its speed. Howard and David explored the inside while Melissa helped Maria figure out how to buckle up in the side seat. It wasn't long before they were once more in the skies again. As they flew invisibly, Howard and David commended Tony on the lack of turbulence. As Tony put the jet on autopilot, he took off his seatbelt and began walking around. Turbulence should be the least of your concerns. I wouldn't have built this if it had such a flaw. Howard and David nodded in respect. Maria then leaned in and whispered, Should we tell him now? Howard leaned toward her and whispered back, No, let's wait until we land and settle down before telling him. Tell me what? Tony asked, looking at them in confusion. Maria and Howard looked at each other. Maria mouthed, sorry, but Howard only shook his head and sighed. Sit down, son. We have some news to tell you, Howard said. 
putting a hand on Maria's thigh. Okay, Tony said slowly, looking at them suspiciously and with worry. It has come to our attention that your mother is pregnant. Wait, ah. Uh, Tony, David, and Melissa shouted as they looked at them. Why are you surprised? Melissa asked David. Obviously, since this is the first time I'm hearing about this, it was after you left when you were accepted into UA. Your mother got lonely, and so to cure her boredom we got busy. EWWWW. Tony shouted, covering his ears. I don't need your narration through your sex scene. You perverted bastard. I'm going to agree on this with Tony. You are sharing too much information with us, David said with an uncomfortable expression. Melissa was the same as she nodded her head in agreement. Maria was blushing as she pinched his side. Ow, right sorry. Anyways, your mother has been missing her period, and just early morning yesterday, she was woken up by morning sickness. We went to a clinic quickly where the doctor informed us that she was having a baby. Which is why David is only hearing about this now. Tony just looked down and had both his hands over his head. Holy shit, I'm gonna be a big brother, me, a big brother. Am I even ready for such a responsibility? Tony began breathing a bit heavily, causing the others to look at him in concern. Tony, they called out with worry. Seeing their worried looks, Tony took a deep breath to calm himself down. Sorry, I was a bit overwhelmed with such news. First of all, congratulations, you guys, Tony said as he went and hugged both of them. They hugged him and thanked him. Melissa and David did the same afterward. For the rest of the trip back, they looked towards Tony, who was staring upwards with a lost look as he kept muttering, I'm gonna be a big brother. They all soon landed back in his lab. As everyone settled, Tony walked around like a zombie, bumping into things before they headed towards UA. There were balloons and decorations everywhere. Tony and Melissa's parents went to sit in the audience VIP seats. Everyone was waiting inside a waiting slash prep room. Kaminari looked towards Momo and asked, Hey, where are Tony and Melissa? They were receiving their parents. Her words were interrupted by something banging loudly on the door. Their heads snapped towards the door when they heard Melissa's voice. Tony. Melissa came in and sighed, while Tony followed right behind her, holding his forehead in pain. Melissa guided Tony to his seat before plopping down in hers. What's going on with Tony? I've never seen him this... Out of focus, Momo asked. Melissa rolled her eyes as she said, He just found out his mother is pregnant, and he's going to be a big brother. He doesn't know how to act now. Kaminari and Kirishima, hearing this, laughed. They went and patted his shoulders. Someone is clearly excited. Congratulations. Todoroki wanted to say something, but seeing how Tony was and hearing the reason, he chose to stay quiet. Ida then appeared through the door. We're up, you guys. Kaminari and Kirishima looked at each other. Seeing Tony was still a bit absent-minded, before smirking. They wound up their hands and smacked him on the back. Ow! Tony yelled before glaring at Kaminari and Kirishima. He stood up and began chasing them around the room. He had them both in headlocks, suffocating them. You bastards, what was that for? It was to wake you up, Kaminari choked out. Yeah, what he said. You're with us now, aren't you? Kirishima said as he hardened his neck. Seeing everyone leaving the room, Tony sighed and released them. He then glared at them. If we are ever against each other, I will show you guys no mercy, he said as he walked away, joining Melissa. Kirishima and Kaminari just smiled at each other as they ran after him. It's U.A. Sports Festival, the one time each year when our fledgling heroes compete in a ruthless grand battle. Present Mike shouted to the large crowd. First up, you know who I'm talking about. The miraculous rising stars who brushed off a villain attack with their steely willpower. The first year of the hero course. Everyone soon walked out, with Tony wearing sunglasses taking the lead and Melissa right next to him, with both Jarvis and Friday visible. Everyone else followed behind. There was loud shouting and cheering from the crowd, causing them all to grow nervous, except for Tony and Melissa, who were used to this. Present Mike then began introducing the other classes when the R-rated hero Midnight took the stage in the middle. She walked to the mic stand 
causing a small riot. Quiet down. Now everyone, for the representative of the first-year students, who went above and beyond passing both exams and gaining the highest marks in the history of UA, Anthony Stark. There was loud cheering upon hearing his name called. Some were surprised by midnight statements, some even refused to believe them. Tony casually walked towards the mic stand and looked at everyone. He found his parents up in the VIP stand and smiled before looking back at the crowd. Shut up and watch. They were all taken aback by his words and arrogance. I see some of you doubting me, doubting if I even deserve to be here to be part of the hero course. And to that I say, shut up and watch. I'll show you that I'm better than everyone else, better than my opponents. If you can call them that, he scoffed. My classmates, my friends, and those that even came before me. Is it arrogance? Maybe, but like I said, just watch. I've said enough already. Tony smiled toward everyone as he lowered his glasses and winked before lifting them back up and walking off. There was a stunned silence, as they didn't really know what to say to that. And let the sports festival officially begin. Present Mike shouted to break the silence as Tony walked out and joined the others, who were just looking at him in surprise. Third person's POV. After present mix announcement, Midnight took the stage and announced the first event of the sports festival, the obstacle course. Everyone soon lined up at the starting line, each with a look of determination. Some even glared hatefully at Tony due to his earlier speech. On your marks, present Mike yelled. Get set. Both Tony and Melissa got into a running position. And goo. Tony and Melissa burst forward, passing everyone before Todoroki had a chance to freeze them to the ground. Tony and Melissa ran like Olympic runners. Ahead of them, they saw robots from the entrance exam lined up, blocking their way. Friday, Jarvis. Both Tony and Melissa called out respectively before saying simultaneously, Gloves! Jarvis and Friday's flipper arms retracted into their compartments, revealing two openings for their hands. Tony and Melissa both inserted their hands and immediately pulled them out, now equipped with metal gauntlets that formed up to their elbows. Tony shot repulsors at the ground, propelling himself into the air and towards the robots. He wound up his fist and punched a robot, breaking it into pieces with his fist imprinted on the green metal. Meanwhile, Melissa pushed her palms out, sending two beams of repulsion that destroyed and pushed the robots out of the way. Tony landed perfectly and continued running while Melissa used her repulsors to propel herself forward. As they passed the robots, they felt a cold air in front of them. Looking back, they saw Todoroki freezing the ground as he skated forward at great speed. Tony and Melissa looked at each other and smirked, then began firing at the robot's legs, making them tumble and fall, blocking the path behind them. Don't think you can get ahead, you bastards. They heard shouting from behind. Without needing to look, they knew it was Bakugo. Meanwhile, some who were frozen in place broke free. Kaminari used his electricity. Hiroshima hammered away the ice. Mina melted it with her acid. And Jiro hacked at it with her earphone jacks. They then heard a crackle of energy and saw a green flash blitz past them. Midoriya ran past everyone, catching up to Todoroki, and used the tumbled robots as stepping stones to jump from robot to robot. He appeared beside Bakugo, causing Bakugo's frustration to grow. His explosions became stronger, blasting him ahead of Midoriya. Midoriya leaned forward as he ran, cheeks puffed up, catching up. They both immediately passed Tony and Melissa. Seeing this, Tony and Melissa jumped into the air. Thrusters! Friday and Jarvis deployed two leg braces, attaching them to Tony's and Melissa's legs. They rolled in the air and just before hitting the ground, their foot thrusters activated, propelling them forward. They appeared side by side with Bakugo and Midoriya. Todoroki then joined them, skating at the same speed, while Momo also appeared. She was flying on top of them wearing what appeared to be a jetpack with goggles on. Look at Class 1A Go. They are ahead of the competition. I've never seen such a tight race. You must be proud of your students. Aizawa, who do you think is going to win? Present Mike shouted as the entire crowd cheered them on. They've all trained very hard to be where they are today. Could be anyone's game, Aizawa explained plainly. 
They all reached the same obstacle. A giant wall almost as tall as a skyscraper, specifically made for rock climbing with small step stones to hold on to. Tony and Melissa both stuck their arms and legs out to break before shooting towards the sky. Akugo and Momo followed after them. Midoriya used one for all to grab onto the stones and boost himself up, beginning to climb. This part slowed Todoroki down. When they reached the top of the wall, they had to drop down, as any higher would be considered out of bounds. Tony and Melissa shut down their thrusters and landed back on the ground. The ground cracked and shook underneath them before they reactivated their thrusters and flew ahead again. As Midoriya jumped over the wall, Todoroki stood on top, freezing the entire wall and creating small steps to climb down. When the others reached the great ice wall, Kirishima hardened his fingers and climbed up using his own strength. Tokoyami used Dark Shadow, while Jiro used her earphone jacks to lift herself up, although her ears hurt afterward from the added weight. Tony and Melissa continued to be neck and neck, flying ahead of everyone else. Ahead, they saw a large pond stretching for miles with small boards to use for crossing, but Tony and Melissa flew over it, parting the water with their speed. It appears that Tony Stark is keeping true to his word. He is dominating the competition, flying over all the obstacles. Present Mike shouted. And he isn't the only one. By his side is Melissa Shield, going just as fiercely. Even though they are both corkless, their genius creations make up for what they lack. The next obstacle was a straight path, but on each side were metal poles with turrets that fired blue electric bullets. Though not harmful, they were painful and intended to stun students, slowing them down. This was a course Tony and Melissa couldn't simply fly over as it would be out of bounds. Instead, they ran into the turret area, moving their arms to block the electric shocks with their metal gauntlets, while Jarvis and Friday flew around their backs, tanking hits for them. This demonstrated to the audience how great their reflexes were, as they ran straight through the multitude of bullets without getting hit. Momo, just behind them, pulled out a circular shield from her stomach, similar to one she had seen in Tony's lab. Instead of being themed around the American flag, hers was more aligned with Japan. She charged ahead through the turrets under the protection of her shield. Bakugo used his explosions to move all over the place, dodging as many bullets as he could. When Tony and Melissa got out of the turret field, the last obstacle was a minefield. Like most of the obstacles, they flew over it perfectly. The others then appeared by the turrets. Kirishima hardened his skin, making the shots useless against him. Kaminari surrounded himself in a yellow electric aura, absorbing and storing the shots inside his own body. Mina used an acid slime hamster ball to run through, the shots unable to penetrate. Midoriya charged through the electric shocks, gritting his teeth in pain but not slowing down. He then ran through the minefield, his speed allowing him to charge through, with the mines exploding after he had already passed. Tony and Melissa were neck and neck, and present Mike hyped it up through the mic. Everyone was on the edge of their seats, cheering, some even for Momo, who wasn't far behind. Melissa! Tony shouted, feeling the rush of wind against his face. Yeah, Melissa asked, her mind focused on the finish line growing closer. I love you, Tony said as he spun around and blasted her with both his repulsors. Jarvis, detecting the danger, charged in and tanked the hit, but the force pushed him into Melissa, causing her flight to go haywire until she stabilized herself. Tony charged ahead of Melissa. You bastard, she shouted. Jarvis then warned Melissa of the danger behind her. She spun around and, in the same motion, caught the shield Momo threw at her and sent it back. Momo caught it as Melissa finished her spin just in time to see Tony cross the finish line. And we have a winner. Everyone. Just like he said he would do. Even at the cost of betraying his girlfriend. The winner of the obstacle race. Anthony Stark. With second place following. Melissa Shield. And in third. Momo Yayorozu. Third person's POV. I should really be kicking you in the shins. What the hell was that for? Melissa shouted angrily at Tony. Tony shrugged nonchalantly. It's me winning, obviously. No need to be a sore loser about it. Melissa rolled up her sleeves. Oh, I'll show you what sore truly means. 
Come here. Tony immediately ran away, with Melissa chasing after him with a demonic expression, both of them kicking up a storm. Tony got behind Momo using her as a human shield. Momo found it amusing as they bobbed and weaved around her. Come on. Didn't I say I love you? It was supposed to show that it was nothing personal, Tony said, moving Momo around. Melissa cracked her knuckles. Since hurting the one you love while saying, I love you, is supposed to be okay, why don't I express to you just how much I really love you? Your love for me is really strong, you know? I can feel it all the way through my human shield. There's no need, really. Hey, Momo called out, hearing what Tony was calling her. Melissa scoffed before looking at Momo. Don't think I've forgotten how you threw that shield at me. Momo rubbed the back of her head, a bit embarrassed. Sorry about that. Since Tony got first, I at least wanted to get second. Though it didn't go as intended. No hard feelings? Melissa grumbled. I'm surrounded by traitors. As they continued joking around, the area around them began to fill up with students who had passed the obstacle course. The ones to pass to the next round were the top 50s. 1. Tony Stark 2. Melissa Shield 3. Momo Yairozu 4. Izuku Midoriya 5. Katsuki Bakugo 6. Shoto Todoroki 7. Juzo Hananuki 8. Ajiro Kirishima 9. Denki Kaminari 10. Mina Ashido 11. Kyoka Jiro 12. Etc. With last place, 50th, belonging to Aoyama. Bakugo bit his lip until it slightly bled upon realizing he came in fifth place and that Midoriya was a place above him. Todoroki had his fist tightened as he released a bit of steam from his mouth, having used too much of his cold side and was freezing. Midnight, who was still on the stage as she never left, continued with the sports festival. Those in the top 50 from this qualifying round will move on. But worry not to those that didn't make it, we have other ways you can show off. And now is when the main selection really begins. The press corps are going to be jumping out of their seats for this one. So give it all you've got. Now on to the second event. I already know what it is, of course. Midnight let the suspense build up, something she was really good at. Dying in suspense, aren't we? But worry not, since the next event is this. She motioned to the screen behind her, which displayed the words, Cavalry battle, cavalry battle? Melissa read with a pondering look. I take it we will team up one way or another, Momo figured. Yeah, I wouldn't worry though. We'll make a fantastic team. Tony nodded with a large smile. Ha! Ah. Melissa scoffed. She turned to face Tony and put a hand on her hip, pointing her finger to his nose. You can kiss my cute little tush if you think I'm going to team up with you after the stunt you just pulled. She said in English before showing him her hand and walking away. Tony leaned towards Momo and whispered, Is it weird that I find it kind of hot when she gets like this? Momo looked at him and shook her head. You are hopeless, she said as she walked away from his side as well. Tony just stood by himself with a confused look as Midnight went on to explain the cavalry battle. Participants, on their own, will form teams of two to five members each and get into a horse and rider formation. She exclaimed as images appeared on the screen behind her. The rules are fundamentally the same as an ordinary cavalry battle. Snag your opponent's headbands while guarding your own. But with one exception, each of you has been assigned a point-based value according to your ranking in the last event. The point value of your team will depend on the members you have chosen. Your individual point value starts at five at the bottom, so the student who took 50th place is worth five points, while the student at 49th has 10 points. Capice? Seeing everyone nod, Midnight nodded back in acceptance. Her smile then grew larger and more sinister. Now, here's the twist. The person who came in first is worth 10 million points. She yelled, swinging her whip with every word. Everyone slowly turned and looked at Tony with bloodthirsty eyes, as if waiting for him to show any signs of weakness so they could devour him. Tony smiled, lowered his sunglasses, and winked. Don't stare too hard. I might just blush, he said with a confident smirk, which, although unintended, earned him some points with the ladies in the audience as they found his total confidence attractive. Midnight continued with her speech. There's more suffering for those at the top. As you must have heard countless times since enrolling into UA High Plus Ultra, 
Midnight stared at Tony with a smirk. After taking first place in the qualifiers, Anthony Stark possesses a total of 10 million points. Tony felt the aura everyone was giving off intensify as Midnight reiterated. She began posing with her small whip as she continued to explain, not caring for the position she just put Tony in. The match will last 15 minutes. Each team's points are determined by its members. The rider will wear a headband displaying the total number of points. Until the end of the match, you'll all compete to grab each other's points and maintain the ones you have. Any other headband you grab must be placed on your neck or higher. The more headbands you get, the harder they will be to manage. Most importantly, even if your headband is taken or your horse formation is broken, it's not over until it's over. Midnight swung her whip to emphasize, quirks are allowed, so it'll be a brutal battle. However, it is still a cavalry battle. Maliciously attacking another team with the intent of making them fall will get you a red card. And that means you're out of the game. Midnight finished off by saying, you all have 15 minutes to begin forming your own teams, and those 15 minutes start now. Without hesitating, Tony began running with a purpose in mind. Tony saw Momo talking to some people but snatched her away. She belongs to no one but me. Tony exclaimed with enthusiasm. Momo's face turned bright red. Tony, what are you doing? Tony set Momo down and enclosed her hand in his, staring into her eyes. Momo, I want you to be with me. Just me and no one else. WW, what are you saying? She shouted, growing even redder. I need you, Momo. I won't take no for an answer. Please be on a team with me. Momo was fanning her face with one hand and glared at him. I want to face off against you and Melissa. I'm in third place after all. I should be forming my own team. Tony sighed and said, Then you leave me no choice but to bribe you. He went over and whispered, I have a way to make you stronger quickly and permanently while being 100% safe. It's yours if you agree. Wait, seriously? Momo asked, looking at Tony in surprise. Tony nodded. When have I ever lied or exaggerated about a product I've created? Momo pondered for a bit. Her face scrunched in contemplation before groaning loudly. Fine, but I swear, Tony, if you are lying, I will be seriously mad at you. Yes, Tony pumped his fist. Come, let's get our next teammate. Tony ran as Momo followed. Tony found some students crowding around Kirishima, trying to recruit him. Tony just pointed at Kirishima. Kirishima, you're with me. No offense, dude, but you're worth 10 million, Kirishima answered awkwardly. And to that I ask you this. Tell me, what can be any more manly than a man facing an army? It will be us against everyone else. You will be able to show off just how strong and unbreakable you really are. Kirishima's eyes lit up, practically aflame at the thought. He wound up his palm and Tony did the same. You son of a gun, I'm in. It will be us against the world. That sounds so manly. They then followed Tony as he continued finding their next teammate. Hagakure, I want you on my team. Huh? Me? She asked, pointing at herself. Tony nodded. Just imagine it. You, the invisible girl, will be in the spotlight, where people will really take notice of you. That sounds nice, she muttered. Do you have a plan? I do, and I need you for it, Tony smirked. Hagakure sighed. Very well, it could be fun. Yes, Tony said, pumping his fist. Now, come, let's find our last member to tie all this together. He said as he jogged a bit, the others following close behind. He smiled as he looked at their last teammate. Mineta, I need your balls. Ha! Huh? Third person's POV. Mineta shook his head vigorously. Are you kidding me? I don't want to be targeted by everyone. No. No. Tony smirked. You know we're going to be the center of attention, which means a lot of ladies will be watching us. Who knows, if they see your performance, they might just want to date you. Where do I sign up? Mineta immediately agreed, his eyes sparkling. After gathering his team, Tony led them to a corner. Momo, I need you to create something to cover us while I make some things. In the 10 minutes we have left, I'm going to create items that will help us. 
Momo sighed and from her back created a large tarp, covering them from being seen. Meanwhile, Melissa assembled her own team. She grabbed Mina, Kaminari, and Jiro. You guys are coming with me, huh? Why? Kaminari asked. Since Tony helped you guys grow stronger, I'm going to use that to my advantage and use you against him. Is this because of what happened during the obstacle course? Mina asked, both curious and amused. Melissa huffed and nodded. There is nothing fiercer than a woman's scorn. As they say, Jiro said with a smile. All right, I'm down. So who's going to be our last member? Kaminari asked. We'll need someone big and who can tank hits. And I know just who to go for, Melissa said as she spotted Shoji standing out in the crowd due to his large size. And the 15 minutes are up. Midnight addressed loudly before present Mike took over. Formed your teams? Made your plans? Too bad if you haven't. Here we go. The countdown to this brutal battle royale. Tony took off the tarp that was covering them, revealing Mineta in large white metal boots and arms, making him a good horse. Tony was the rider, wearing all his team's numbers around his neck, with his 10 million point headwear placed right on his forehead. Momo looking a bit tired already. Three. In Melissa's front were both Shoji and Kaminari, while behind her were Mina and Jiro. 2. Midoriya's team consisted of Urarika, Mei, Ajui, and Ida. 1. Bakugo and Todoroki formed a mixed match team with the remainder of Class 1A and Class 1B. Start. Tony smirked as he lifted his forearm, a small computer appearing. As he pressed it, small drones emerged from behind him. Multiple holographic forms of Tony appeared, and as they appeared, Tony started disappear. So which one is the real one, I wonder? They all said simultaneously. Everyone stood confused, unsure which one to go for as all the holograms began running around. Jiro, check with your earphone jacks to see if you can hear their footsteps, Melissa ordered. Jiro's earphone jacks extended and punctured the floor as she closed her eyes to focus. But with everyone attacking each other and too many movements, she clicked her tongue in frustration. I can't make it out. Too many people moving at once. They're making too much noise. What is this? There appear to be multiple images of Anthony Stark moving around. Is such a thing even allowed? Aizawa? From what I was able to witness, yes, yes it is. We have previously stated that all quirks are allowed to be used. Now then... Let's think about who his teammates are and we can already infer what he has done. Momo Yairozu's quirk allows her to create things she understands. Using her quirk, he probably had her create items for him to use and build. It is no secret that Tony Stark is a genius, an inventor with almost no equal. It wouldn't be unfair to assume he built something in that short time to enhance Hagakure's quirk, allowing her to reflect light on a large scale, making them all invisible. And as the rules previously stated, everyone is allowed to use their quirks. As long as it isn't used maliciously, Aizawa calmly explained. Melissa moved her head back just in time to dodge Ajui's outstretched tongue. She saw the tongue retract and Midoriya flying towards her with a jetpack while his team wore rocket boots. Mina! I got it! Mina replied as her acid started expelling from her skin. She created a lot of it and threw it on the ground to their side creating a wall of acid. Midoriya and his team had to stop, hitting the wall of acid briefly, giving Melissa and her team a moment to move away. Not a moment later, they heard an explosion behind them. Turn us around quickly, Midoriya ordered. May and Ida turned them just in time to see Bakugo flying towards them with his hands stretched out. Deku! Meanwhile, Melissa ordered Shoji, Try to use your eyes to see if you find even a flicker of light off of them, while also keeping a lookout for anyone trying to attack us. Yes, ma'am, Shoji answered casually. Multiple eyes began to appear and extend from his body as he saw Todoroki preparing to attack. Todoroki at six o'clock, he warned. Sharp turn, Melissa commanded. They all took a sharp turn just in time as Todoroki sent out a wave of ice that froze everything in its path. Todoroki clicked his tongue but was fine with it as he froze some in front of Melissa and grabbed their headbands. Although I'm having a bit of difficulty finding Tony, I sense his drones creating the illusions. Shoji said his ears also appeared around his body. They're all in the air. 
Melissa nodded. Kaminari, I leave it all to you. Shoji, help me out. Melissa said as she grabbed Kaminari by the back of his shirt with her metal gauntlet. Both Shoji and Melissa flung Kaminari into the air. I'm the star of this show today. Kaminari shouted as he discharged a large amount of electricity everywhere. Remember, guide it, don't control it. He reminded himself as he moved his body around in the air, directing the lightning he discharged. The images of Tony and his team distorted before an explosion occurred. Pieces of drones rained down as Kaminari began to fall with them. You guys are going to catch me, right? He yelled, worried. Shoji created multiple hands to safely catch Kaminari and place him back in position. How many times can you do that? Melissa asked. Two more times before I short circuit, Kaminari explained. Wait, I should have thought of this sooner. Melissa exclaimed aggrievedly. Jarvis, helmet. The top of Jarvis opened up and shot something out, attaching to Melissa's face. It shifted into her mask, the HUD activating, and her eyes glowed a light blue color. Jarvis, find me that sneaky bastard. You couldn't have done that earlier? Kaminari looked back at her in disbelief. Sorry, when it comes to Tony, he always manages to get in my head and get the better of me. Melissa said apologetically. Now then, let's get our 10 million points. Found him. Melissa muttered as she saw an infrared version of Tony with his team in a corner observing everyone and everything. As if detecting someone's gaze, he shifted his head and looked at her. His infrared version blowing her a kiss, causing her to scoff, though she couldn't deny the smile on her face. I found him. Straight ahead, Tony tapped Kirishima. We've been found. Finally. This wasn't what I was promised. Don't worry. I was just letting them tire themselves out. It's time we go on the offensive. We had to give Momo time to rest. Tony smirked. I think we've been doing just fine. Mineta cried out. Can I undo our invisibility then? This is a bit uncomfortable. Hagakure questioned. In a bit, when they get here. Only Melissa can see us. We can use that to our advantage. Meanwhile, everyone continued to clash. Minoma managed to touch Todoroki's back, causing his team to retreat and create a wall of fire in front of them, stopping others from advancing. Minoma also covered the ground with ice, stopping some from moving. Ha 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 ha. Is this the best class one a escot? IT doesn't seem like much to me. Minoma taunted, laughing maniacally. Third person's POV. Melissa raised her arm and aimed a repulsor towards him. Kirishima, it's your time to shine, Tony said as Melissa fired a repulsor shot to undo their invisibility. All it ended up doing was exposing Kirishima's hardened arm from Hagakure's quirk before it was covered back up again. Mina, you saw where they were, right? Yup. All right, Mineta, Momo, move out, Tony ordered. Mineta activated his rocket boots while Momo still had her jet pack, which moved them out of the way from Mina's attack but Melissa was still able to see where he was going. She pointed towards their direction, guiding her team's movement. As she caught up to them, Tony and Melissa began a physical altercation. The sound of metal clashing resounded through the area as Tony blocked all of Melissa's attempts. Melissa reached for his headband, but Tony blocked it by pushing it away. She then aimed her hand downward and blasted the object in Hagakure's hand, which revealed their visibility. There he is, someone shouted. While Melissa looked at him smugly, Tony didn't look the least bit worried. Looks like your resting period is over, Momo. It's time we get serious. Everyone soon began making their way towards Tony in hopes of getting his 10 million points. The first one to appear before them was Midoriya and his team. Ajui attacked with her tongue, aiming straight for his headband. But Tony simply grabbed it with one hand while he shot a repulsor straight at Melissa to keep her at bay. Just when he was able to pull Ajui's tongue, it slipped out from his grip due to its slimy nature. Meanwhile, Kirishima and Momo held everyone back from approaching any further. Midoriya crackled with green energy as he shouted, Detroit Smash, which sent out a large gust of wind that threw them all off balance as Midoriya jumped and used May's jetpack to reach over towards Tony. But Tony wasn't unbalanced. Hiroshima managed to stay on the ground due to hardening his figure, thus not making him move. 
Tony grabbed Midoriya's outstretched hand, spun him around, and flung him back from where he came. Those ten million are mine. You metal bastard. Bakugo shouted, flying towards Tony. Tony simply focused on Melissa as he said, Friday. Friday flew in front of Bakugo with her chest piece opened, her arc reactor letting out a flashing beam of light that blinded Bakugo, causing his flying to falter. Luckily, Ciro's tape caught him and pulled him back before he hit the ground. As Tony and Melissa fought, Tony gained a teasing expression. Friday, we will have to talk about you and your love for public indecency. How can you just go and flash your chest at someone like that? Melissa couldn't help but laugh as she heard that. Boss, you are lucky that you have programmed me to cause no harm. Otherwise, I would have hit you for such a comment. As Melissa reached and Tony blocked, the thrusters on her gloves activated as she slid her hands off the gauntlet and reached over, taking the 10 million headband from his forehead. Run, run, run. Melissa shouted to her teammates as her gauntlet was still pressuring into Tony. They all turned around and began running as Tony flicked the gauntlets off of him. Mineta, this is where your balls are most needed, Tony said as he extended his hand, and Momo gave him a rope she had to her side. All while they stopped paying attention to Tony and headed for Melissa now that she had the headband in her hand. Please stop wording it like that, Mineta pleaded. Tony grabbed one of Mineta's balls from his head, tied it to the rope, and began twirling it around rapidly, picking up speed. He gave it a quick toss, and it went speeding, landing right on the headband in her hand. Tony yanked it back from Melissa's hand, taking her by surprise. They all looked back to see Tony catching the ball in his hand and giving it a little shake in a taunting manner. What a turn of events, folks. In one instance, Anthony Stark lost the 10 million point headband to none other than Melissa Shield. But not even a second later, he snatched it back up from her hands. If only we could see that in instant replay, present Mike shouted with enthusiasm. Just then, they felt a sense of cold wind permeate the air. Tony turned towards the feeling, expecting to see Todoroki, only to find out that it was Minoma who had copied the quirk. He then felt another wave of cold air from his opposite end and immediately guessed that it was the real Todoroki. Tony saw that he was being approached from all sides. He stood up over his teammates and said, Friday, chest. Her chest plate flew from her and stuck to his, quickly shifting and forming as his arc reactor spun, locking in place and glowing brightly. Spin me around, Tony ordered as he released a large repulsor from his arc reactor. Tony shot a beam as a warning shot, which ripped through the ground, creating a large circle around him. The ground around them shook as Tony's repulsor beam carved a wide, smoldering circle into the arena, halting everyone's advance. Todoroki narrowed his eyes, assessing the situation. We need a different approach, he muttered to his team. Midoriya, regaining his balance, nodded. Let's regroup and find an opening. Meanwhile, Melissa's team scrambled to recover. We need a new plan, Melissa said, glancing at her teammates. Shoji, keep an eye on Tony's team from above. Kaminari, prepare to stun them. Jiro and Mina, stay ready to support. Bakugo, still reeling from Friday's blinding tactic, growled in frustration. Elbows, we need to get that headband. Let's find an opening. Belly button, shoot at their feet. Todoroki's team, consisting of Tokoyami, Sato, Koda, and the Class 1B member, also regrouped strategizing their next move. Tony stood at the center of the chaos, the arc reactor on his chest glowing ominously. All right, team, he said calmly, we need to keep our defenses strong. Momo, keep creating barriers. Hagakure, stay invisible and provide intel. Hiroshima, you're our shield. Mineta, be ready with those sticky balls. The intensity of the match escalated as the clock ticked down. The teams maneuvered, dodged, and attacked with renewed vigor, each aiming to secure the 10 million point headband. Ajui's tongue shot out again, aiming for Tony's headband, but this time, Tony was ready. He dodged her attack and countered with a swift repulsor blast that sent her reeling back. Stay focused, Ida shouted to his team, pushing his engines to the limit as he charged towards Tony. 
May's gadgets buzzed with energy, ready to support their offensive. Melissa, determined not to let Tony keep the upper hand, activated her own boosters and launched herself at him. Their clash was a blur of energy blasts and quick maneuvers. Now, Kaminari, Melissa shouted. Kaminari unleashed a surge of electricity, aiming to disrupt Tony's systems. Tony's suit flickered but held steady, thanks to Friday's quick recalibration. Nice try, Tony said with a smirk, but you'll need more than that. From above, Shoji relayed crucial information to Melissa's team. They're vulnerable on the left flank. Go now. Mina and Jiro dashed forward, coordinating their attacks. Mina's acid created a slippery terrain, while Jiro's earphone jack rapidly whipped around. Amid the chaos, Midoriya saw an opening. Urarika now, he shouted. Urarika activated her quirk, making Midoriya float. Using May's jetpack, he rocketed towards Tony, aiming to snatch the headband. Tony saw him coming and prepared to intercept. However, just as he was about to grab Midoriya, Bakugo swooped in from the side, explosions propelling him forward. Out of my way, Deku! Bakugo snarled, aiming for Tony's headband while Aoyama shot his naval laser towards their feet. But Hagakure extended her hand and deflected the attack, exposing a bit of her hand and causing her to be a bit surprised. In the split second of confusion, Todoroki felt pressured and instinctively used his fire, sending a wave towards Tony. But he wasn't the only one. Monoma's left side unleashed a torrent of ice. The combined force at which they sent it at Tony created a powerful shockwave that destabilized the entire area. The final seconds ticked away as everyone converged on Tony. In a last-ditch effort, Tony activated a full-body repulsor burst, pushing everyone back. The buzzer sounded, signaling the end of the match. And that's time. Present Mix voice boomed through the arena. What a spectacular show of power and strategy. Anthony Stark manages to hold onto the 10 million point headband. But let's not forget the incredible effort from everyone. The students panted heavily, some collapsing to the ground. Exhausted but exhilarated by the intense competition, Tony looked around at his teammates, giving them a nod of approval. Great job, everyone. Just then they heard Momo's stomach rumble slightly. Tony looked at her in amusement as she turned bright red. If someone wasn't so demanding of my quirk, I wouldn't have to go through this. Tony just rubbed the back of his head, looking at her apologetically. Third person's POV. We will now see who the five teams moving to the next round are. In first place, we have Team Tony Stark. In second place, we have Team Todoroki. What? Melissa shouted. She turned towards Todoroki and saw a bird on Koda's shoulder with a headband as he handed it to him. Baby, I know you love me, but you should have focused on other people beside me, Tony said, sounding disappointed. In third place, we have Team Melissa. Jiro handed her a headband as well. I managed to get this from the one who threw fire towards Tony earlier. Melissa jumped and hugged Jiro. Jiro, I love you so much. Jiro just patted Melissa's arm, a smug smirk on her face. In fourth place, we have Team Bakugo. And in fifth place, we have Team Midoriya. Ha 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 suck it DKU. Bakugo yelled as a miniature explosion occurred in his hands. Midoriya just looked a bit disappointed with himself. As everyone headed towards the lunch hall for a break, Tony, Melissa, and Midoriya found themselves in a secluded corner with Todoroki in front of them. Why are we here? Melissa asked curiously. This is the part where the mysterious quiet kid tells us his tragic backstory. Tony leaned towards Melissa and muttered loudly. Tony, Melissa elbowed him. What? What if he really is here to tell us his backstory? We have to be supportive. We have to make sure he knows we are here to listen. We don't want to discourage him, she muttered just as loudly. Todoroki had a plain expression on his face as he looked at the two of them. He then focused on Tony. You managed to overwhelm me, even though you weren't even focused on me. So I had to break my own pledge. As for you too, is one of you All Might's secret illegitimate child or something? Huh? Both Melissa and Midoriya said at the same time. 
I heard how close you two are to All Might. Not to mention, Midoriya shouted one of All Might's signature moves during the battle. Tony and Melissa just stared at Midoriya with a deadpan look. Midoriya began stuttering as he moved his hand around. It's because I really admire him. That's all. He's always been my biggest inspiration. So I used his moves as examples. I literally explained that All Might's my uncle, Melissa said, shifting the attention from Midoriya. Todoroki shrugged. It could have been a cover story to hide it. Anyways, that's not the point. You guys are hiding something, I'm sure of it. Even if we are hiding something, what does that have to do with you? It really shouldn't be any of your business, Tony said with an unamused look. Todoroki stood quiet for a bit, realizing Tony had a point. You know, my father is Endeavor, the second greatest hero of all time. So if you're somehow connected to the number one hero, that will be more than enough reason for me to crush you. Melissa just turned towards Tony and looked at him in confusion. My dad is a powerful bastard with only one thing on his mind. Getting stronger. Yeah, he's gone and made a name for himself as a hero, but he's always seen the living legend that is All Might as an obstacle and an eyesore. My father could never beat All Might on his own, so he went with another plan. I'm sorry, but I don't understand. Why are you telling us this, Todoroki? Midoriya asked. Have any of you guys ever heard of cork marriages? Melissa's eyes widened when Todoroki asked this. You don't mean? Already having a feeling where Todoroki was going with this. Todoroki just closed his eyes and gave Melissa a single nod. They started becoming a problem during the second or third generation after quirks appeared. Strong individuals would choose a partner and force them into marriage. All for the sole purpose of passing on a stronger version of their own quirk. So in the early generation, they surely lacked ethics. With his fame and wealth, my father made my mother's family agree to the marriage. All to get a hand on her quirk. Raising me as a hero so I could surpass all might, just so I could fulfill his own ambition. I hated it, being made into a tool for that human garbage. The only thing I can remember is my mother's constant crying. He said as he began touching the burn scar on his left side. I can't stand to see that left side of yours, she said before pouring scalding water on my face. Melissa put a hand over her mouth in shock, while Midoriya shuddered in horror. It's much more impactful seeing it in person than on screen, Tony thought with a small frown. That's rough, buddy, Tony said sympathetically even Bakugo, who was listening in behind a wall to be detected, gained a serious expression. In short, not using my left side was a sort of my own revenge against him. Never using my rotten father's quirk. No, by rising to the top without using it. I'll deny him everything. That's stupid, Tony said, plain and simple. Tony, Melissa said. Even Midoriya just looked at him in surprise. Melissa wanted to say more, but they all saw his serious expression. Todoroki raised a brow. Why do you think so? He asked curious to know what Tony was thinking. I'll answer that with a question. Tell me your hair. Is it yours or your father's? What? Just answer the question. Todoroki touched his hair slightly in confusion. Mine? It's the same with your quirk and your quirk factor. Todoroki's eyes widened a bit in surprise. Yes, your parents had some influence in the making of them, just like the rest of your DNA. But ultimately, they are just you and no one else's. You know how fingerprints and eye retinas are always different and no two are ever the same. Todoroki nodded his head. So our quirk factors, which are what make up your quirk. Sure, it might have been influenced by your father's quirk, but it's its own thing. Here, I've been researching quirks for a while if you think I'm lying, Tony said as he took out his phone, typed something out and showed a hologram. The hologram showed three balls of swirling energy, two on top and one on the bottom. The red belongs to the quirk factors of a father, the blue one is from the mother, and can you guess who the purple one belongs to? Their child? Todoroki muttered as he stared at the purple energy. And do they look anything similar to the other two? Todoroki shook his head, then stared at his own hands with a look of deep contemplation. Tony shut off the hologram. I'll leave you to think on your own. Tell me once you stop being stupid so we can actually train your quirk how it was supposed to be trained, 
Todoroki looked at Tony in confusion. What do you mean by that? Tony rolled his eyes. Your quirk. Have you ever thought about mixing them together and making them one? Tony then grabbed Melissa's hand and began walking away, not bothering to look at Todoroki's stunned expression, just waving him goodbye. As they were far enough away, Melissa leaned on Tony's shoulder and smiled. You never experimented on a father and mother, did you? Nope. Tony smirked, causing Melissa to laugh. You big liar. Now come. I want something to eat. Melissa smirked, dragging him to where everyone else was. When they arrived, they found the others eating something casual, so Tony and Melissa joined in. Tony saw someone waving towards him and noticed Kaminari and Mineta gesturing him over. Tony smirked, already knowing what was going to happen. As he approached them, Melissa went towards the girls. Dude, you have to help us convince them, Kaminari said in a hushed tone. Mineta rapidly nodded his head in agreement. Don't worry, I'm in. I'm winning here as well by seeing Melissa in a uniform, Tony said, giving them a thumbs up. Kaminari pumped his fist excitedly. Lunch break was soon over. Before we get off to the final event, I've got good news for those out of the running. This is still a sports festival, so we've prepared a recreational activity for all participants. We even shipped in cheerleaders from America to get you pumped up. Present Mike paused. What's this? It appears class A would also be putting on a show. All the girls from class 1A stood there holding pom-poms with a deadpan expression. Except for one. Melissa decided to just go with the flow. Tony had his phone out, taking multiple pictures from different angles as Melissa posed for each one. Oh baby, work it. Snap, eat them up Melissa. Snap Melissa had one pom-pom in the air while the other was on her hip, looking at the camera with a kissy face. Uhu, Melissa, don't hurt them. Snap. Melissa then brought the pom-pom by her mouth and extended it out as if blowing him a kiss while winking. Melissa then brought the pom-poms close to her chest, shaking them about. Come on, ladies, let's show them our routine. All the girls just looked at Melissa in confusion, having no idea what she was talking about. Give me a P. Give me an L. Give me a U S. Melissa sang while forming the letters with her pom-poms and her body. Give me a U. Give me an L. Give me a T. R A. She continued, forming the A by putting the pom-pom on her hips and spreading her feet. What does it spell? She yelled enthusiastically. She jumped into the air, did a backflip with her knees tucked in, and landed in a split with the pom-poms in the air, shaking. Plus ultra. Everyone in the crowd yelled, thrusting their fists in the air. Melissa then pushed herself into the air, landing back on her feet. All the girls could do was look at Melissa in complete surprise, wondering who she was and what had happened to the real Melissa. Melissa then hooked arms with Momo. Come on, ladies, let's hook arms and follow after me. They were all dragged by Melissa's energy and enthusiasm, linking arms. Melissa began kicking side to side, alternating legs as she sang, plus ultra, plus ultra, we're going plus ultra, plus ultra, plus ultra, we're going plus ultra, we are class 1A, and we're going plus ultra. They all then unlinked arms as Melissa slowly crouched with the pom-pom in the middle as if building up power. As they crouched, Melissa then asked, who are we? Class 1A, the crowd shouted. And how are we going? Melissa, along with the rest of the girls and the crowd, both slowly started off as they said, Hello. They all then jumped in the air as the crowd shouted alongside them with large smiles. Ultra! And where was Tony during all this? Holding on to Friday for dear life as he couldn't stop laughing and was about to fall over. Third person's POV. Melissa, Mina, Hagakure, and Urarika were seen happily waving towards the crowd with their pom-poms, while Momo was covering her face due to how embarrassed she was. Melissa walked up towards Tony and smirked. That was unexpectedly fun. Tony, who was wiping his tears from laughing so much, scoffed. Really? I couldn't tell? He said sarcastically. Melissa just rolled her eyes at his sarcasm and decided to tease him a bit. Hmm. I wonder what I should do with this outfit. I should probably throw it away. 
Why would you do such a thing? Why would you commit such a crime? Tony asked, aghast. Meanwhile, present Mike was hyping up their performance. What a fantastic performance from Class 1A. It seems to have motivated the crowd to cheer for Class 1A. Now then, since that's over, let's begin with the final event. Between the 25 members of the five winning teams, we'll have a formal tournament, a series of one-on-one -on -one battles. Now I know what some of you are wondering. How can we do a one-on-one -on -one battle with an odd number of players? But here's the catch. On each round, there will be a lucky player who will draw a lucky slot and automatically move to the next round. The first match will be 12 battles in total, with the lucky person going on to match 2. Match 2 will be 6 battles in total, with the other lucky person going to match 3. Match 3, the quarterfinal, will be 3 battles in total, with a lucky person moving into the semi-final. The semi-finals will have no lucky person. IT will be a battle to determine who will be in the finals, where the two top contestants will fight for first place. It wasn't long before the 12 matches were posted, plus the lucky guy who would move to the next round. The lucky person was Mineta, with the following matches. Anthony Stark vs. Aoyama Yuga, Tiyu Ajui vs. Hiryu Rin, Hantasiro vs. Kyoka Jiro, Bakugo Katsuki vs. Kaminari Denki, Hiroshima Aijiro vs. Toru Hagakure, Melissa Shield vs. Tokoyami Fumikage, Shoto Todoroki vs. Rikido Sato, Tenya Ida vs. Mei Hatsum, Izuku Midoriya vs. Tagaru Kamakiri, Momo Yayorozu vs. Sen Kaibara, Ochako Yuraraka vs. Koji Kota Mina Ishido vs. Mizo Shoji Tony looked towards Mineta. You are so lucky. It's unbelievable. Mineta rubbed the back of his head with a pretty happy expression. Haha. Who knows? Perhaps with this luck, all the beautiful ladies will want to be with me. I would happily let my luck rub off on them. His happy expression changed to that of a perverted one. Tony just sighed. Why do I even speak to you? After the lineup and everyone knew who their opponents were, the festivities commenced. During this time, Tony decided to spend time with his mother and father, while Melissa decided to spend time with her dad. They all watched the festivities from the VIP room. Howard nudged Tony as he asked, So when are you going to make me a suit? Tony just blinked as he looked at Howard. Dude, you know how to make the arc reactor. Why can't you just make the suit yourself? Howard just looked at Tony in confusion. Isn't it obvious? Because it's your product. How should I say this? Those suits are now a part of you and you are a part of them. If I just went and copied it, it would feel like I'm stealing something important from you. Wow, that is surprisingly considerate of you. I didn't know you had it in you, old man, Tony said, looking at his father in surprise. Howard just gave Tony a plain look and scoffed. So are you getting me one? Of course I'm getting you one. I'm actually getting you both one. Melissa is making one for her father, Tony said, shaking his head. Actually, I had something else for you and mom when you were coming over. But now I'm not sure since mom is pregnant. What is it? Howard asked curiously. I don't want to talk about it in the open. Tony informed him. Howard nodded, while Maria just shook her head. Tony, honey, I appreciate the thoughtfulness of it, but I don't need a suit of armor, she said in amusement. Please, when I make it, use it for protection. I synthesized this new metal that is really good for protection. I named it Vibranium. After explaining what it does, Howard had a surprised look. You created a metal that absorbs kinetic energy and distributes it. You never fail to amaze Tony, Howard, Tony, and Maria continued conversing, discussing many things. Maria was mostly interested in his social life and the friends he made during his time at UA. It wasn't long, however, until Tony had to go as he was the first one up during the tournament. Present Mike then began presenting the two contestants up to the stage. In the first match, we have a contestant that has dominated events after events. His name has rang out in Japan for many years now. Please give it up for Anthony Stark. Everyone soon heard heavy footsteps as Tony appeared from his entrance wearing his full blue and golden armor, with only his face and black hair visible. There was thunderous applause as Tony appeared wearing his armor. Many were impressed with it. Some even wanted one for themselves. 
Others were more interested in its capabilities and what it had to offer. Present Mike then presented Tony's opponent. And on the other corner, we have his classmate and course mate. A guy that always shines. Aoyama Yuji. Aoyama began walking as if he was a runway model, posing until he arrived in front of Tony. We oui, we, oui. Let's put on a magnificent show for everyone watching, Manami. Sure, dude, Tony said casually. The rules are simple. Present Mike started off. Win by knocking your opponent out of the ring, immobilizing them, or getting them to say, I give up. Bring the pain. We've got our good old recovery girl on standby. And fight dirty if you must. Ethics have no meaning here. Well, of course. Going for the kill is ano ano. You'll be disqualified. Because a true hero's fists fly only when in pursuit of villains. Now let's get this thing started. Ready aye aye? Tony's mask closed over his face as his eyes lit up. Showing their activation. Aoyama's devices around his stomach glowed slightly. Start. Immediately, Aoyama sent a beam from his belly button device. The light beam traveled rapidly through the air, hitting Tony straight in his armored stomach. However, instead of moving or being sent flying back, Tony stood rooted in place without any reaction. Tony just calmly began walking casually, swinging his arms side to side and making his way through Aoyama's beam. Aoyama's stomach began rumbling, but he wanted to at least believe he tried to win so he didn't give up and increased the power of the beam. Tony quickly arrived in front of Aoyama. Aoyama, seeing how pointless it was, stopped using his beam. Tony just stared down at Aoyama. Walk off, Tony said without much emotion. Aoyama was holding his stomach in pain and his legs were closing into each other. Merci beaucoup, he said graciously for not hurting him. Aoyama then slowly walked out and headed back the way he came from, while Tony turned around and did the same. What a show of power, folks. Just with his mere intimidating presence and words alone, he discouraged a competitor into calling it quits. Want to know what I considered power and the pinnacle of heroism? It's when your mere presence and words speak volumes. There we have it. Folks, the first round done in less than a minute. The winner, Anthony Stark. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.